do this. Yay! Okay, we are recording. So welcome to our first um, Super Salon uh, in 2021. Um, we went from a very crazy year to a potentially even crazier one, but I'm sure Tyler will have a more, uh, more uh, concrete idea about that than uh, I might have. Um, I am assisted uh, by Anton Tronikov tonight, who is a fellow Intern Tech host, and he's famously the co-host of the Scientific uh, Freedom Book Lab with Arno Schenk, who's also here. Uh, we are also joined by a bunch of other um, Intern Tech hosts. I can see David McDougall from London uh, is here. Um, Etienne is here from, uh, from Montreal. Uh, I think Bronwyn is joining us from uh, Johannesburg. Matt Clifford is here from Oxford. So we are as usual, quite, a, quite an international bunch. And I'm really excited to see what we will um, arrive at. Uh, I'm going to drop the mic at Anton <laughs> just to, uh, just to uh, give him a chance to enjoy himself as well. And then Tyler, the floor is yours. Oh, and by the way, sorry, just, just, to, um, just to give a bit of a housekeeping thing, uh, just use your raised hand uh, uh, um, you know, bravely. Uh, we will keep an eye on that. And it's not going to be very you know, much sliced into two discrete um, portions, this uh, event. So you will probably get a chance to speak if, um, even if you just raise your hand randomly when you have something important to add. Thanks, Anna. And yeah, he hello everybody. Some of you uh, will know me, others will get to know me in the course of this, uh, this panel discussion with Tyler. Um, I'm very excited to have Tyler on and, and discuss Malthus with us. Um, as we said in the in the sort of the preamble or the intro text of the salon, Malthus and and, and his ideas uh, underpin um, quite a lot of socio political and economic thinking. Um, and let's see, you know, how that might extend into our present and also into our future. And um, yeah, just just on the mention of housekeeping, uh, Zooms. Uh, raise hands tool, which is, I think, what Anna was referring to, because I've had participants in our salons before literally raise their hand, and we can't see all your pictures at once, so that might not work. Uh, the raise hands tool gets gets moved around. I think right now it's behind the more hamburger menu. So if you'd like to raise your hand, that's the place to do it. Um, at this point, yeah, Arno already I'll... raised his hand, so it's possible. Thank you for thank you for testing the software. I'll uh, uh, take this uh, point to just hand off to Tyler and, and, and get this thing going. So off you go. Malthus is one of my favorite economists. I believe he's one of the most important thinkers, yet it's remarkable how rarely people read Malthus. They read Marx, they read Adam Smith, they read Hayek. And I've been thinking, well, why not Malthus? One reason Malthus is so interesting is he is the economist who was obsessed with sex. What can be uninteresting about that? Furthermore, he is the economist who is obsessed with food. So food, sex, and he was a reverend. So he has all of the ingredients of an interesting thinker. In Do you think time, it's just that he was open? He was openly obsessed with these things. Everybody else was just thinking about it. Absolutely. And he wrote about them his whole life. Uh, so it's remarkable how much to this day we use the word Malthusian. You see it in the press all the time in educated conversation. So I thought what we should all do is go back and read just a slice of Malthus to get a sense of what he's all about. And I'm gonna give you no more than 15 minutes, my take on what it means when an economist is obsessed with sex and with food openly. It's very different from what you often hear when you hear the word Malthusian. So most people, they hear Malthus, Malthusian, and they think gloom and doom, we're all going to die, the world is coming to an end, or whatever version of this you might have in the back of your mind. This is not really what Malthus said. But let me give you a bit of chronology here. There are different editions of Malthus's main book, Essay on Population. So you read an excerpt from the 1826 edition. The first edition, it's very important, it's 1798. So Malthus, he's this young guy, he has a stutter, he has a lisp, he doesn't seem to be socially adept, and his father is a man of the Enlightenment. His father is good friends with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is obsessed 
with equality. His father is a good friend with William Godwin, who is a kind of utopian who thinks they'll just be the forward march of progress. So Malthus is hearing all this at home. He thinks it's BS and he rebels. And in 1798, he publishes this pamphlet anonymously and it's all about population and food. And this pamphlet, it, it kind of is the doom and gloom version of Malthus. And he basically says, well, population is just gonna keep on going up in linear fashion, right? People in essence, breed like rabbits in the early Malthusian model. Yet agriculture itself is subject to diminishing returns. The best lands give you a lot of food. You cultivate more lands. It's harder and harder to get as much food as what you got from the best lands. So there's a big crash. People are gonna end up dying. We're doomed for some mix of periodic starvation and you'll always have enough people to keep wages at subsistence. It truly is a doom and gloom picture. So people who think Malthus is doom and gloom, they're not just making it up, but they're not perfectly informed either. Because Malthus was super smart, learned very quickly. His mind was really a marvel. We can get back to this. But by 1803, another edition comes. So Malthus took in all the different criticisms the 1803 and all the later editions, they are much more sophisticated than that. Malthus says these should really be thought of as new books. He's changed his mind. There are endless statements of Malthus saying, this doesn't mean doom and gloom. Civilization can get better. Uh, people can improve their lot. Education is important and so on and so on. But subject to constraints, Malthus is still a theorist of constraints and he sets up in the pages I had you read what I would call the Malthusian trilemma. And this I think is the most important point of Malthus. It's basically in one sentence toward the end of the reading that you all have done. And Malthus says, look, you can, there's still this tension between the desire for sex and limited food supply. You can have what he calls moral restraint the typical form of moral restraint is you marry at age 28 instead of age 22. In Malthus's time, not everyone knows this, at least in England, the average age of marriage was about 28 for men, 26 for women. So moral restraint like was a thing. It was not impossible. Malthus himself realized as an economist openly obsessed with sex that like up until age 28, you're not actually morally restrained you're up to whatever, who knows what people are doing on the farm, right? But you weren't necessarily breeding children. You might've been visiting prostitutes or whatever you were doing, but you weren't having too many kids. And if you're not having too many kids, you can make do with your food supply and you can improve people's living standards, right? So for Malthus, moral restraint is a possibility but he stresses it's really very hard, but the world he lived in had some fair degree of it. So he didn't think it was impossible. The other alternative for Malthus is what he called vice, which took many forms, but vice, the simplest way to think of vice is that society is like one big London brothel. So there's a lot of sex I read Malthus as realizing prostitutes used some kind of birth control. Maybe it was just infanticide or sophisticated version of a rhythm method or whatever you think they did or not having the kind of intercourse that can lead to children being born. But Malthus saw vice as a very plausible and indeed possibly likely alternative that the urge for sex is so strong. And yes, as I started by saying, Malthus was openly obsessed with sex. You can satisfy it using vice. And that's an alternative to moral restraint. But Malthus looked down on vice because vice in his time, it did mean something like organizing society like a big London brothel. And in 1798, 1803, 1826, I mean, Obviously, I wasn't around then, but from what I read, a London brothel was a totally disgusting, repulsive place, both practically, epidemiologically, one might say morally. 
not a pleasant option. So Malthus is not embracing vice, but he's saying, look, it's an option. And I think he's at least willing to consider that vice is better than starvation. And then the third option for Malthus is what he calls misery, and that is starvation or pandemics. Pandemics we're now a bit more familiar with than we used to be. And what Malthus is saying is societies have to choose. Is it moral restraint? Is it vice? Or is it misery? That's the trilemma. It's one of the three. And what he's pointing out is there's not any easy way out of this trap. Now, when people today rebut Malthus, I think if they haven't read him carefully, they're like, oh, this guy didn't see the Industrial Revolution or fossil fuels, or I've read Julian Simon, there's all this progress study stuff, and we're just gonna have a big cornucopia of stuff, and you know, we're gonna just eat chocolate all day long, or you know, whatever. I mean, I don't think Malthus understood how much wealth there would be, but he definitely understood we might have more wealth. I don't think Malthus overlooked that. I think what Malthus overlooked, and Anna today had a, a wonderful, brilliant tweet pointing this out exactly. What Malthus overlooked is that the technologies of vice would change so that we would have an alternative of vice that would not be as bad as the London brothel. So what are the technologies of vice today? Uh, Anna, I think, mentioned three. One was pornography, right? Which, whether or not you think it's a vice, I think Malthus did. Uh, there's different kinds of drugs. And of course, there are computer games, all as substitutes for having children. And again, the point isn't whether you think it's a vice, but it counts as those set of things that gets you not to have children. And the point is, whatever you think exactly of all those things, like smoking marijuana and staying at home and not going on a date, I would submit it really is a lot better than organizing society like a London brothel, even though it's not really where I want to see the world being headed. So Malthus's mistake, if that's the word, is simply he underestimated the powers of markets to tame and neutralize vice. Another form of vice, I would say, is the campus storm. There's a lot of sex there. Some of it is coerced or semi-coerced. Some of it may be in a gray zone where everyone's been drinking. Uh, a lot of it with birth control. Again, you're all going to have different opinions about campus sex. Probably a few of you have had it. But again, Malthus would have thought it was vice. Malthus was a reverend, right? And you know, on a lot, reading a lot of people, I'm a Straussian. I think there are these secret codes and what they said, but I read just about everything Malthus wrote, including his private letters. There is no reason to believe Malthus was a Straussian. With Malthus, I think what you read is what Malthus really thought. And he's pretty clear. And when he changes his mind on things over the years, he's pretty clear about that. So Malthus was not a Straussian. He was a reverend. So he's the person who laid out like, what is the key dilemma? What are the choices before us? Another way of putting it is you can think that Malthus is saying you can have a sort of successful society either if people are very, very good or if people are bad. And it's hard to find these intermediate points. Or another way to put it is there are like the laws of sex and there are the laws of food. But each of them enacted collectively, they're not entirely consistent and it gives rise to clashes over resources because sex can sort of work more quickly than food can. So, uh, I mean, that's just my very basic take on Malthus, but I'll just say a few things. So he sees food as the binding constraint and that's fine. It clearly was in his time, but a more contemporary reading of Malthus, you could think it's the ability of the atmosphere to absorb carbon. You could think it's biodiversity. You could point to any number of environmental issues and it could be consistent with the Malthusian framework. So be willing to generalize from the simple problem of food alone. And when you view it that way, again, the chance that Malthus was right is quite a bit higher. You can also view Malthus as being a theorist of robots. So he talked about human sex, didn't have robots back then. 
But like the cost of feeding robots, building robots, keeping them fed with electricity, that also interacts with wages. So Malthus, in a sense, is saying, look, you think market economies are dynamic? Well, yeah, they're really dynamic, but they're dynamic at building robots, just like people are dynamic at having sex. And like at some margin, these robots are going to lower wages and also create environmental problems. That's another more general reading of Malthus. It's clearly not in his words, but a mere hop, skip, and a jump. And it's easy enough to imagine the Malthus of 2021, I think, would have said exactly that. Two other things interesting about Malthus, and we can get to, to much, much more. Uh, but one is just how multicultural a thinker Malthus was. Now, I know probably none of you or not many of you read the whole book, which is long. But most of the book is actually about empirics. And Malthus talks about all the different societies in the world. And at first, he says like rude things about like the indigenous inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego. Today, it would get him canceled. Of course, back then it was fine. But you read these sections as a whole. Malthus is a total revisionist. He's actually slamming the West. He's actually saying, look, you people think you're so great. But you look at your European societies. You look at these ancient Greeks and Romans that you so blah, blah, blah about, oh, they're so wonderful. And they're ruled by the exact same principles as the Tierra del Fuegans, the people in Africa, the people wherever you want to look. So kind of analytically, Malthus was this radical egalitarian. And part of the book was to say, Europeans, Englishmen, white people, however you want to break it down, you folk are not special. You're just obsessed with sex like everyone else. And you're going to meet the same fate and you're subject to the same constraints. So don't be thrown by some of the like cancelable rhetoric. Malthus is on the right side of a lot of issues. He was strongly opposed to slavery. He worked a bit with William Wilberforce to oppose slavery. He was good on a whole lot of issues. Malthus also was a precursor of Keynes. Now, I'm not a Keynesian in every way, but the idea that depressions, recessions could be caused by shortfalls and aggregate demand, he was the first person to lay that out in a coherent way. That's a big, big contribution. So Malthus had a lot of things to say about economics that were highly valuable, whether or not you agree with each and every one. Truly a brilliant person. The final thing I'll say, this is just for age of social media. Malthus had a very famous correspondence with David Ricardo. At that time, Malthus and David Ricardo were England's two greatest economists. Malthus was a believing Anglican reverend. David Ricardo uh, was a Jew whose family had come from Spain and then the Netherlands, and they became best of friends. And over a period of over a decade, wrote each other letters. And if you're disillusioned at social media today or some of your email correspondences that collapse into, my goodness, whatever, read the letters between Ricardo and Malthus. They're perfectly preserved. They're online, open access. They're in the collected works of Ricardo, not the collected works of Malthus, but they're there. You can Google to them. Liberty Fund, collected works of Ricardo, volume six through nine. Every letter is a gem. They're such polite debaters. They're always arranging to try to see each other as a model of how to interact, how to have a friendship, how to have intellectual engagement. It was like the true inter-intellect of its day. And they just debated these issues and then got together. They at least pretended their wives were best friends too. Maybe they were, I don't know. But if you're ever down by the state of social media and want to read like an antidote, I would just say turn to this very wonderful correspondence. Some of it does require you to know about the time, but it also teaches you about the time. And I think Malthus often is at his best and Ricardo in that correspondence where they're just bouncing ideas back and forth each other, debating, admitting when they're wrong, trying to steel man the other person's arguments, all the stuff we talk about today, like how it should be. They were doing like in 1811. And that to me is really inspiring. Now there's much more to be said and will be said, but I think over Zoom when one person goes on and on and on, like that's not the spirit of Malthus and Ricardo, which is inter-intellect exchange back and forth. So with all that, I will stop for now. 
and turn it over to Anna and Anton. Wow, thank you so much. You know, I was kind of wondering, I know you we, you kind of explained it to me why Malthus, right? Because so my very strict take on what Tyler should talk about at Inter and Tech Salons uh, was anything you want. <laughs> and you said Malthus. And, and I was really wondering, uh, you know, that beyond uh, what we discussed, you know, was there anything else uh, motivating your choice? And I think it's very clear now that beyond just unearthing, you know, um, uh, an oft discussed but rarely read, um, you know, giant of, of economic thought, we have, you know, far more areas of re relevance here, uh, potentially than, than uh, what we might have thought. So uh, I, I definitely will uh, dive into the correspondence and, and imagine Malthus as an interinsect host. Um, who would be as brilliant and uh, divisive as uh, we would probably expect him to be. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Anton, any notes? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come straight at this. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm definitely not a Straussian. I don't have the patience to read between the lines. Um, and I tend to take what people write at face value. So I have to, I have to sort of come straight at this and, and ask pretty much directly, what about Robert Solo and exogenous growth? and an increasing margin of product due to technical progress. Where would you say Malthus would stand on this given the recent economic history of our world? In the solo model, ideas are generated at some rate. That's the A in his model. It's sometimes called total factor productivity. Uh, Malthus is very aware that there's innovation. He doesn't believe in a static world. He just thinks there's some medium term or maybe long term where the more innovation you get, the more you press on your environment in some way. And in his time, it was food, but it doesn't have to be food. So I don't read Solo as refuting Malthus. I do read Solo as giving us a weapon against Malthus, but Malthus understood very clearly. It's one of the things I think he, he got the best that every critic who had an answer to the Malthusian dilemma was also pointing out factors that over time would make the dilemma even worse. So Malthus thought if we had good policy, if we educated people, if we had enough moral restraint, that living standards over time could indeed rise slowly. I think he underestimated they could actually rise pretty rapidly, say as they have in China. Uh, but again, whether Malthus was wrong, I think we still don't know. He might have been right. And I would say this, for 99% of human history, clearly Malthus is right. Like Europe in 1700 is not richer than Europe at the birth of Christ. So, or take the Stone Age or anything in between. No matter how wrong you think Malthus is, he's still right about more than 99% of human history. And how many other economists can say that? Like say you love Hayek, you love Friedman, you love Keynes. They're all correct, if they are correct, about less than 1% of human history. And the other 99% belongs to Malthus. That's pretty amazing. We don't take that seriously enough. I, 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 don't, I don't refute that in any way. What I'm mostly interested in is have we broken uh, from Malthus or not? And, and, and one, so sort of one, one counterpoint to my own argument here uh, in, in, in the tradition of correspondence we've just discussed is uh, Solo's, uh, Solo's model neglects uh, this, this thing that we often do see happening as total factor productivity increases is that if you find a more efficient way to utilize a given resource, it actually produces more demand for that resource rather than less because it reduces the price. And in that sense, you know, we sort of, we sort of return to the same limits that, that uh, Malthus was discussing. I, I, basically, I want to understand whether or not we've made it out of the box yet, and how will we know? I don't think we'll ever know, but I find it striking how many people actually are Malthusians. So take Elon Musk, who, or Jeff Bezos, they seem obsessed with settling Mars. I don't think it's just a PR thing. I, I believe they're, they're sincere. Maybe if we can settle Mars, some Malthusian constraint goes away for a long, long time. So if you think settling Mars is important, you're almost by definition a Malthusian. No one calls those guys Malthusians, but it seems to me they are. So just how much Malthus lives on, reemerges, the people who nominally claim they're the most optimistic, 
are actually often the most Malthusian. Brian Armstrong of Coinbase, another guy deeply interested in settling Mars. If you are, you must think there's some really scarce factors here on Earth that are going to bind us. So the funny convergence between the kind of mega utopians and the Malthusians, they kind of circle around and meet up at the other side. Like with all ideologies, right? But what's really interesting to me is that you mentioned Musk and his brother is an agricultural innovator, right? Like they are growing, you know, beetroots from the wall under artificial light. I mean, surely that's going to come in handy on Mars. But, you know, that's a really great proof for how, you know, the, um, the questions of land and growing enough food to, um, to look after the population that has not really been resolved. Um, you don't have to go into uh, Margaret Atwood you know, Oryx and, 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 um, and other um, uh, character stories to, uh, to look at the, you know, little sci-fi examples of, you know, 70% real tuna set on the packaging uh, in 20 years uh, due to just the scarcity of, of, of that resource. So, you know, that's, that's, to me, that's really interesting. But what I think we don't really talk about or we haven't really addressed um, tonight yet, and I will then go to um, Rafi and, and Peter just really wondering about this, um, is the question of social engineering and really open almost, you know, there are the thinkers before eugenics became an, a no-no and they have a, a tone to them that might seem a bit scary to be read today. Um, and I think Malthus is, I mean, he's talking about different strata of society and the, the um, you know, the, the, the increase of, of, of numbers of, of, of populations at different strata. Um, and that can seem a little bit worrying, perhaps for um, the thinkers of today who may be reluctant to talk so openly about social engineering at that level. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts about um, both the food production and the social engineering aspects, but I think that would be really interesting to, um, to touch upon. It's very interesting that Malthus quite explicitly discusses social engineering and eugenics. And even though at this point there's no Darwin, there's no Mendel, what Malthus says is, is very sophisticated. And it seems he had spoken with animal breeders. He says he thinks that through eugenics, you can make people taller or affect some of their physical characteristics, maybe the color of their hair. But he said, when it comes to making people smarter or more restrained, he thinks eugenics is quite limited, that there are at best small gains. And if you try too hard, you will end up with people badly screwed up in some other way. So I'm not sure this quite has been tested, but this is a very modern contemporary view that if you just like tried to breed people for intelligence, you would end up with a certain kind of inbreeding and different diseases, and it wouldn't necessarily go very well. So just how many of the different options Malthus considered? I might add another Malthusian was Keynes. Keynes was obsessed with Malthus. He wrote a biographical sketch of Malthus, which I think is online. It's the, maybe the single best thing written about Malthus. And uh, Keynes mostly agreed with Malthus. But Keynes thought that eugenics would work and give us better people. And that was his way out of the Malthusian dilemma. But Malthus on eugenics in 1803, I think is more perceptive than Keynes was at any time in his lifetime. That it's not some kind of free lunch where you can just elevate people and obviously make them better. Thank you so much. Excellent French horror movie, uh, Crimson Reverse about uh, social engineering uh, for smarter people in a small French Alpine campus town. Much recommending it for anybody who might consider it. Um, and then, then you will probably have to leave the lights on when you sleep. Rafi, go. Hello, Tyler. Um, my question is about the trilemma. And I guess the, the I don't know if this is an adage or if I made it up based on what I've heard, but men who don't have children make war. So in the, in the, you know, the virtue category, you've got men not getting married until they're 28. In the vice category, you've got men having sex with prostitutes or goats until they're 28. But in both categories, they don't have that taming function that women or children give them in the, the classical and, and chauvinistic sense. Do you think that that is an issue where it's like all paths lead to misery? Because if there isn't, uh, if, if there is only virtue or only vice, then men are going to make war. Malthus wrote about this very directly, and he understood exactly the issues you're laying out. And Malthus said one of the main reasons to 
we needed to understand why Hemalthus was correct was to avoid war. And that moral restraint also meant that you were sufficiently content with your unmarried lot that you had a way of dealing with it almost theologically and that you could bear this state of affairs with a minimum, maybe not zero vice, but a minimum of vice, a minimum of unrest. And he saw this as truly very difficult. I mean, think of Malthusus as like the book of Genesis an original sin, but with some economics piled on. But he was very interested in international relations. I wouldn't say he was a complete pacifist, but he was quite anti-war, very skeptical about the Napoleonic Wars. And he saw maintenance of a peaceful international order as one of his main contributions, actually, that we needed to understand the social dilemma to solve it, to stop young men from wanting to go to war over land and food because they were desperate or restless or had nothing to lose or whatever it would be. And that's an aspect of Malthus, by the way, that Keynes picks up on. So when you read Keynes's description in Economic Consequences of the Peace, maybe it's chapter two, uh, like why Europe had, had all these wars, it's very much a Malthusian account. And he basically says as much. So just to make sure I understand, it's basically the, the, the counter argument is Malthus is saying wars that happen over scarcity, that's what I'm solving for. There are also wars that happen over this human psychological drive for conquering the world, and those need to be conquered by what he's calling virtue and contentment. Yes, which ideally should be Christian. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's interesting because I read the, the, it's the other way around that it's married men who make the most money of all demographics. Uh, apparently having a bunch of children and a wife at home is a good motivator uh, to ask for a raise. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Peter, Peter Easton, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, so so it's, instead of Solo, the economist I was thinking about is Gary Becker, which is not, not unusual of me. And, and the idea of a quantity quality trade-off when it comes to children. So. Uh, you get richer and then you, you, you uh, make fewer children, but you educate your children more. So this idea of human importance of human capital that is quantity quality trade-off. And I think when, when Marlos suggests that like kind of educating people is kind of one way out of, uh, out of misery, um, it, kind of, it, it kind of turned out to be right. Well, maybe not for, for the same reasons he was uh, thinking about, but... Um, I don't know whether there's anything else in, in Malthus because I, I didn't read that, that much Malthus about, uh, about the role of education or whether he has anticipated any of these thoughts. Again, I think you have to look at Malthus over time. If you go to the 1798 edition, it's just not that sophisticated. It's like he wants this Freudian poke at his dad. Like, dad, you can't have your utopia. But especially if you read Malthus's pamphlets on Ireland, a very practical problem. Ireland back then was desperately poor and he visited Ireland, I think it was 1821. And he still applies his population ideas to Ireland. But the notion that progress is possible, education is important, uh, education will make us more productive and ease the constraints of food supply and Ireland truly can be much better off. Uh, it's all very clearly there. And again, not no Straussian issue, it seems really clear as day to me. And what's in his correspondence, what's in the pamphlets matches up very closely. And I, he did believe in progress and he thought it could be stable. But again, just think of the book of Genesis. If you're gonna read Malthus, the best place to start is the Bible. He was a reverend and the Bible was the most important book back then, even for non-reverends, the Bible and Adam Smith. And that's what Malthus is integrating. So in the Bible, especially Genesis, but not only, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of civilizations falling, empires collapsing, tribes going to war. So he wasn't dismissing that. He knew that was the normal state of mankind, but he was hoping to find like this razor edge path where humans as a whole could end up somewhere better than what was in the book of Genesis. And he thought like following Malthusian doctrine, was the only possible way to get there. Very okay. arrogant in its own way. Yeah. 
I was wondering what, uh, what did you think about the arts? Did you see that as a healthy channeling of enthusiasm uh, for vice or did you see it as, a, as an, ins an inspiration for vice? I can't recall anything in Malthus where he discusses the arts. I haven't literally read all of Malthus, but I've read most of it. Uh, my sense of him as a human is he was brilliant, but somewhat narrow. What he really loved was to debate economics and social theory, and he would do that endlessly. It motivated him much more than theology, and he thought he had figured out something so important and just would spend the rest of his life talking to the world about it. And again, I think he was always a true believer, but it was not, while it was his main influence, it was not his main motivator. I get no sense when I read Malthus writing about other parts of the world that he thinks it's important to like convert them to Christianity. He actually thinks it's a somewhat futile endeavor. Like this isn't gonna get you out of my dilemma. So in that sense, he's a very secular thinker. Thank you so much. This is so interesting. And in that sense, he might also be a very uh, kind of forward looking thinker, right? Um, many, many followed afterwards who didn't talk about uh, this part of human nature. But I'm also kind of laughing to myself. I know we discussed this. Bill Bryson has an amazing book called At Home about the history of the of, of our kind of domestic lives. And, and there is a little aside in the book about the institution of English vicars and the intellectual revolutions that led to that you just had these very intelligent people around the country in the UK having all the money and time to, you know, breed Jack Russell Terriers or come up with the Bayesian, you know, statistics or uh, or other uh, inventions. Darwin's um, family would also be a really good, um, a really good uh, uh, example of that. Thank you so much, uh, Neville. I'm going to come to you. Um, anybody who wishes to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, chime in here, please uh, turn on your video and use your name just so we know who you are before we go to you. Uh, thank you so much. Neville, go. Hey, yeah, so I, thinking about that Althusian trilemma and the way that we can sort of like fit modern events into one of those three categories, I'm sort of having trouble thinking of what the counterfactual could be then. Like, what would it look like if Malthus was wrong? If Malthus was wrong, we could all be richer and we could all be virtuous and lots of us and we never run out of food. And we all do you know, like whatever our reverend told us to do. And, and so since the, right. So since the world population is seven times what it was then, I guess I'm trying to figure out like at what point does it tip, but, but right, we're not all virtuous and, and we don't meet all of the criteria. But look, I do think he was wrong. And what I think he was wrong about is he didn't see that we could make vice better than the vice he saw in his England. So again, to be clear, I think he was wrong, but he was wrong in a different way from what you usually hear. Today's vices to me are so much better than a world of starvation that I would just say, given how we use the terms, like we should just opt for vice, full speed ahead. You know, let's triple down on vice. I can't wait to quote you out of context, uh, Tyler, <laughs> after this event. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to uh, throw the mic at Andre. Thank you so much for your patience. And then back at Anton. Um, so we've been having a very interesting discussion so far about food, but I frankly don't think food is an interesting issue at this juncture. So uh, I'd like to propose kind of a different um, set of dilemmas, which is that, uh, in the Malthusian world, uh, instilling virtue or vice in enough people is kind of good enough because you really care about the aggregate. But in a modern world, we're very asymmetric. So the, the problem is that even if 99.9% .9 of the population is uh, virtuous, just 0.1% of the population could ruin it for everyone else because of uh, modern technology, uh, whether that is various forms of bioterrorism or uh, um, nuclear war or whatever. So, so technology kind of changes the set of constraints. On the one hand, it alleviates the constraint on the average, but then it opens us up to a lot more tail risk. And, and I think that is probably the impetus for the desire to colonize Mars as, as well. It's not, I mean, eventually, presumably 
the resources of the earth are not finite, so maybe we'll run out of food eventually in, in billions of years or something. But, but I think the desire to go to Mars now is not at all driven by food, uh, or at least that's what it seems like. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think it's other environmental issues. That said, the world has to make an awful lot of progress to feed all the people who are on the way. And while I think we will do it, I don't take that for granted. Uh, there is, There are serious issues with increasing agricultural productivity enough to feed the forthcoming populations of Africa most of all, and South Asia second of all. I, I mean, I just, just as, I guess as a retort, I mean, as an economist, wouldn't you expect that uh, because there will be increased returns to food production, uh, we will develop more land to produce food? I mean, Malthus already had, had this model in mind, but it doesn't seem like population growth is going to continue at an exponential level in the way that it had in those past times. So. Um, so then we're kind of in a world where population is, is maybe growing linearly and, and even if our technology is growing linearly, that those kind of match up with each other. I agree that it's not, it's not a given that there will be able to uh, provide uh, all the food, but at the same time, it doesn't seem unlikely. Yeah, I would bet on the food and obviously like Canada is going to be fine, but you look at a country like Niger, I think a typical family still has seven kids. It's extremely poor. Climate change is likely to hit it hard. Uh, there's still something to Malthus's literal scenario, though clearly not for much of the world. We can still ruin our land, our fertile land, even if we are fewer, right? And let's not forget like the difference between you know food and sex is that if somebody shows you a really beautiful video of a cake, that's not going to be a lot of help. Uh, so there is an ontological difference here between how self-contained the, the road to satisfaction can become and, and uh, other, other considerations. Thank you so much, Anton. I will give the mic back to you and then we will go to Arno, Sean, Harry and Bronwyn. Sure, sure. Thank you, Anna. Um, I want to revisit a point that we touched on a little bit earlier uh, in sort of discussing how these people who we consider to be sort of, you know, optimistic types of visionaries are actually Malthusian at their root. Um, and what I'd like to do is actually flip that around and take a look at some of the pessimistic ideologies that we've seen come from a Malthusian root in the past. And, 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 and sort of I've spoken to you about this a little bit, Anna, in, in planning this one. And I'd like to put it to Tyler as well, in that one result in human society of accepting the Malthusian thesis is to push back um, the catastrophes that he writes about or, or has proposed and, and you know, accept that the dilemma exists, but put it off and put it off and, and hopefully we can outrun it. That's, that's the optimistic approach. The pessimistic approach, which has been capitulated in, in, in politics and, and, and in, in ideology, uh, since Malthus is always like, okay, we we uh, we accept that the catastrophe is coming. We accept that there's not a lot that can actually be done about it in the long run, but we are very interested in. And so, what this means is that there's a finitary world that needs to be divided among people. And the question always arises: Well, how should that world be divided? And of course, there's always justification why the world ought to be divided in ways that benefit us and not you. And I wonder. Um, what I wanted to put to you was this question of, even if, even if Malthus is correct, does it serve as a society to believe he is? And if, and you know, because it clearly, clearly it could also lead to war, even if you accept the entire Malthusian hypothesis. If he was attempting to prevent war, he didn't do a very good job, given that immediately the question gets asked, well, who should, who should own the resources that do exist and how should they be allocated? And I just wonder sort of, you know, what, what, what are the ideological results of the Malthusian route? How do we, how do we navigate the consequences of these beliefs at, social, at societal scale? I'm not sure if that is a question for me. Uh, I think the way Malthus viewed it 
is that if we could become self-aware about all these problems, that was our one chance of finding a way out of the box. And he also had the view, this goes back a bit to Anna's earlier question, like for Malthus, culture really, really matters, but it's not culture in terms of the arts. For Malthus, culture means one thing. It's how the sexes treat each other and their kids. It's all about sex and family. Is there infanticide? When do you marry? How cooperative are the husband and wife? Like that was all that mattered to culture. That's a very radical view. It's not personally my view, but I find it a fascinating view. Even though I don't agree with it, I don't think it's obviously wrong. So just that Malthus forces us to ask the question, like other than all this sex stuff, like, come on, what is it about culture that really matters? Like maybe it's not that much. And that to me is a very formidable challenge to we moderns, because we're all culture this, culture that, right? My goodness, you see it everywhere you look. And Malthus is very hardcore. He's like, no, I'm going to be a bit reductionist here. You've got to show me that it matters. It's really all about gender. So in this funny way, the kind of truly contemporary gender theorists, radical left types who think everything's about gender, Malthus is their true precursor. Obviously he's way more conservative, but they are just probably without knowing it, pulling it straight out of Malthus. Well, so the thing about that is I don't think you're wrong. I think that this, uh, this lever of, of sex, family, and gender is very important even in our own culture, regardless of how we repackage it. But those drives are easily co-opted by all sorts of um, broader state and social drives. I mean, whenever the state wants to do something, it's saying that it's doing it for the good of the family. And if you're a state and, and a polity that believes that there is no escape from the Malthusian box, then that surely leads to conflict. You know, I once wrote a blog post, which you can Google to, and I think it was titled, Why Don't People Have More Sex? And this is a very interesting paradox for an economist, because economists believe there are gains from trade. If you're married, there should be low transactions costs. If you're not married, especially with apps, there should still be pretty low transactions costs. Yeah, harder in a pandemic, but look, you can just have sex. And I forget the numbers, but the percentage of time people spend having sex, married or not, it's really quite low. And it's sort of supposed to be the most pleasurable thing, right? And yet we're not actually that interested in it. So that to me is another way in which the Malthusian vision is incomplete. And I wonder if he wasn't projecting uh, because Actually, people don't seem that interested in sex. Malthus, by the way, he married at age 38, which is true moral restraint. If I recall correctly, he had three kids, but this is one thing that's interesting. None of his kids had any other kids. I don't know why that is, but uh, they kind of set out to refute their dad the way Malthus set out to refute his dad. And the way they did that, whether intentionally or not, was they had no more kids. They're like, we're not going to be part of this arithmetical process. We're going to show you, Dad. So he had no grandkids. Actually, I was thinking about this today as I was preparing for for the salon, and I, I read your blog post, and and you know, I'm I, I I there was a fantastic article on, in the Atlantic as well last year about why millennials and Gen Z are just just stop having sex, right? Um, and I I. I argued at the time that um, you know the, the title of this article should have been you do you uh, but this was not accepted by the Atlantic um, and I you know I keep thinking about this the children of man argument that in some weird way contraception killed this off for us and the the the, the forbiddenness and the the looming possibility of making babies was what kind of weirdly drove this whole thing for the past you know couple of millions of years. Um, and when it's just one of the hobbies, then people find better hobbies to do. And I was thinking whether the argument could be constructed in a way uh, where you argue that, you know, um, fulfilling hard work is the antidote to vice, but the, the cause of vice is not boredom, as, you know, people would argue to me in my Catholic school growing up, but it's misery, right? If you had the kind of life that Malthus describes in his works, 
um, then your life was a very kind of Hobbesian hell, right? And perhaps sex and food and, and, and the other kind of bottom of Maslow pyramid pleasures were the escapes, right? If you have a generally pleasurable life with all of comfort and you are not propelled to, I mean, unless you are really kind of deeply motivated for whatever reason, you're not propelled to engage in the fulfilling hard work, then, you know, you will just find kind of mediocre contentment and you be more kind of quantitative than qualitative about the acquisition thereof. Um, this was just a shower thought. Um, any, any notes on this before I actually throw the mic at Arno, who was so patient and... I, I just know one thing on that. Some of the latter parts of Malthus read remarkably like Freud. I don't think it's his main argument, but he talks about repression and death drives and conflicts within the will. Uh, I don't know if Freud read Malthus. I'm not, a, I'm very far from an expert on Freud, but if you really dig into Malthus and just look at some of the digressions, at times later on, you'll think you're reading Freud. Very striking to me. Interesting, it's probably because the, uh, in the N Napoleonic times, uh, towards his, the end of his life, the world turned uh, pretty dialectic, right? Uh, so kind of starting to see the world um, as foundation and image or will and image that later on kind of caused that uh, famed repercussion culminating in Marxism and then the Frankfurt School. Um, so that, that seems like a, a normal stop uh, to me to have a Freudian era in, in Malthus's life. I'm pretty sure Freud read everything, right? He was uh, pretty, um, you know, all that, um, sti all, all the stimulants uh, made him very, uh, a very active reader. Um, thank you so much. Um, Arno, do you want to uh, jump in about yeah. Freud, food, sex, any, <laughs> any about her? It's, it's kind of related to, well, I have two things on my mind. One of, is quite related to what Anton was talking about but I'm not sure it's a specific enough question, so I apologize in advance. But the uh, the thing that in the Matusian trilemma, obviously each one, uh, the kind of institutions that surrounds a world that is based around each one of these, uh, either more restrained vice or, or misery, right? They have, they have other side effects. So maybe you can say uh, Christianity has all these effects on maybe religiousness or uh, commercial um, institutions. Uh, and I was wondering basically whether I haven't read very much about this, uh, whether he explores those kinds of side effects of it's not just the moral restraint itself. It's um, you have all these these additional like societal structure things that come from choosing one path over the other um, and whether you know, there's anything about what what a society that is based around. I'll just assume I shouldn't respond to each and every point. So okay, <laughs> people make we other must points. summarize after. The point. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, Sean, do you want to jump in? Sean, uh, sure. My, my, hey, uh, great to see you. Good to be here. Very, very uh, excited to be here. Um, so uh, the observation I have over the last year being stuck inside, um, mostly with uh, young kids ranging from like young teenage to, to, to grade school um, and the, is related to the question. And it's, there's an acceleration of like, Tyler, your point, the, um, the inability to predict like just how much vice would expand into other spots. And so just, is there a, is there a, a thought around um, like vice is accelerating? And I don't mean it like in the kind of, um, shameful way it's it is way way easier to entertain yourself in many many different ways and just the difference between say my 16 year old and my 11 year old my 16 year old doesn't have quite as many ways to entertain himself as my 11 year old does because my 11 year old has started earlier on the sorts of things that are more interesting now while trapped inside and now 10 percent of his life has been stuck inside and so he's able to entertain himself on stuff where it's we're long beyond the, the phase where you'd say why don't you go outside and play it's better for you and more interesting it's actually not and it's not even close what he's able to do on 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 his phones it's much more interesting and so there's like if you think about the trilemma and the different seasons where there was dominant things is there an impact like what what's the net impact of a massive acceleration of vice um in in the sense of the word that you're using and not just like that 
pornography is is everywhere and anytime you, it, it, you know, on your device in your pocket if you need it but I, I i don't know what the net if effect of of that much acceleration of just how easy it is to enjoy yourself and to your point earlier Anna, like my other observation is that it's not boredom that yields the more extreme rings of it like when i've in times where i've had extreme boredom reading a book was fine but in times when i was going through suffering or grief the, the need for more extreme vice was there. And so to me, all of that, like the question is, what happens if we keep accelerating vice at the pace that we are? Does it eat the other, like does the trilemma hold? Does it eat the other parts of it? For me, it's a new case, both for and against markets. So there's so many cases for markets that we know, like markets give us more wealth, maybe. Markets give us greater peace, maybe. You know the list, right? We've all debated these. But the Malthusian case, kind of the meta-Malthusian case, is markets improve vice. And Hayek never put it that way. Milton Friedman, who was a very square guy, he never put it that way. He and Rose, like, that was it. You know, Milton was not out whatever. He, like, worked on monetary theory or Rose was cooking for him. So markets improve vice. Huge case for markets that's hardly ever brought up. But here's the issue, and you're getting at this already. If you improve vice too much, it sucks people away from non-vice. And at some margin, that's a problem. Like what if video games get to be too good or Netflix? Fortunately, Netflix is boring, but what if it had so, on so many good shows that was all you did? Uh, so you don't want to improve vice too much. You want institutions that improve vice enough so that you don't live in a 19th century London brothel, but that don't improve vice too much. And just to think about the social problem in that way, I find really very illuminating. And that's what you get from Malthus. We've seen that with drugs, right? I mean, drugs have improved beyond measure, right? If you are a cannabis smoker, I hear, then there are a lot of different things available that do different things to you. And they come from you know, trying to serve the market, right? And I'm also reminded, um, I think Neil Ferguson writes about how uh, the competition among churches in the US drove to more addictive churches. And you can drive down the road and you have all these, you know, neon lit um, loud churches, which is, you know, probably the um, not the case in a, in a French village where there is one uh, place, to, place of worship. Um, it's the case in Italy, though. And if you look at Italian architecture, you can tell that uh, you know they were heavily trying to outcompete each other from water to water. I have to take the mic to Bronwyn because I can see that she's dying to jump in uh, at uh, markets improvise, and then I will go to Harry. Is it okay, Harry? We, I'm just like switching the order of, of you guys. Uh, so Bronwyn, I'm throwing the mic at uh, Johannesburg. Only if you don't mind. I suppose I've got two sort of comments. I don't know if they're questions so much as comments. And the first one would be. Like given my educational background, also the way I was sort of brought up, I do tend to think quite a lot in terms of the virtue side of that whole trilemma and also in terms of what it actually means, because is virtue even still in play, virtue or morality as a corner in that trilemma in a very secular world? Uh, I'm not sure that secular morality even holds a point in that triangle, because for me, definitely my observations is secular morality is more to do with what, how other people are behaving, not how you yourself are behaving. And only really the sort of faith-based faiths are able to prop up that corner with any sort of reliability to change actual individual behavior. That's an observation. So I'm not sure if you've got a comment on that. That whole corner just seems to be very, very weak at the moment. So I don't, I don't know if, there's a, if there is a substitute or an alternative that can prop that up. And the other one would be how the balance is shifting in different parts of the world. I mean, we've been speaking now about, you know, like vices getting better, virtue, as I'm saying, is probably getting a bit worse if you want to look at, look at that whole thing. But that's a very Western developed world kind of lens. And where we actually seeing population growth, we have really neither of those options. I mean, we don't have porn, great porn, great pulls in terms of both recreational or reproductive controls. Or, or PSPs to escape into in the parts of the world where you really need something to break those cycles. So we're sort of hit, hitting into like divergent features where you've got very different trilemmas playing out in different parts of the world, which is obviously going to lead to some sorts of conflicts. 
because the sort of people in Central Africa with very high birth rates are not the people that are going to be getting onto the first ships to go to Mars whenever that sort of opens up. So I suppose that would be my two sort of observations on the instability of that whole structure at the moment. Yeah, those are great points. Uh, Anna, next comment. Thank you so much. So Henry, um, the floor is yours. And then we will go to Sarah. So we will go to the UK now and then to Berlin. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I had a question about kind of the evolution of uh, Malthus's worldview, I guess, because he's, he publishes the first edition in 1798. So presumably he was thinking about it for a few years before then. And then there's a sort of 32 year gap between the first and the last edition. And then he lives for a few more years after that. So I think he, he dies in 1834. Um, do we see in his writing a that's sort of a long enough time period that presumably if he's predicting population is growing geometrically, then um, after, after that amount of time, presumably he would have had been able to sort of get some sense of whether his predictions were starting to bear out. So do we see in his writing a sense that he feels he is being proven right by events and population growth? Because I'm looking at this graph of UK population growth and French population growth, and it's it's interesting how slowly the population of the British Isles and of um, really it really it's 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 almost like a hockey stick, and hockey stick ironically is about halfway between the first and last editions. So I could sort of see it as you know maybe he you know if you look at the historical data, it doesn't really look like at least the population of Britain is seesawing between sort of growth and um, growth and sort of hitting sort of natural limits. But then, yeah, there, it is interesting how there's this hockey stick that kind of kicks in. It doesn't seem to kick in until after the first edition is published. So um, yeah, I'm just interested to, to get your thoughts from having re read more of what Malthus wrote than me. This is passionately debated at the time. Let me give you numbers. In England, the population in 1750 was 5.9 million. In 1800, it was 8.7 million. It's a big increase, biggest increase in Europe. And living standards did fine. Another comparison, from 1550 to 1800, English population went up 280%. For the rest of Western Europe, France, Spain, Netherlands, what we now call Netherlands, it went up only 80%. So Malthus was living in a time where English population truly was rising. And he knew this was a problem for his theory and he writes about it. And he basically says, well, we're not sure about the numbers or maybe the problems only lie around the corner. And William Godwin replied to Malthus with the 600 page rebuttal, which is online and free, by the way. Godwin was Malthus's original target and so much of Godwin's reply is, look, these numbers have been going up quite a bit for a while. He didn't know the exact correct numbers that we know now, but he sort of, he knew based the basic outlines of what was happening. It was obvious in England, right? More people, hard to hide. And uh, Godwin's response focused on exactly this point, like, hey, Malthus, the numbers are way up. Things are okay, what's your problem? And the people who said that, I mean, essentially they were correct, right? You might think, oh, you know, 50 years global warming will do us all in. Well, maybe, but the catastrophic version of Malthus, it clearly was wrong, even before Malthus wrote it. His tweet didn't age well. The tweet correct. didn't age well. But he didn't delete it. He kept on revising it. <laughs> There's another big difference in Malthus over time. After the Napoleonic Wars, he really writes much, much more about currencies, macro, exchange rates, depressions. And a lot of what he says is very smart, but that becomes his new obsession. That and population, you can think of as his, his two things. The third would be trade, which we can talk about. Uh, one other point I'd like to make, we haven't brought up yet, is Malthus and China is a major connection. So the Chinese one child policy which has had a major, major impact on the whole world and most of all China. That was very directly inspired by Malthus. So if you're wondering, do ideas matter? I mean, my goodness, 
the world's most populous country does this, and they cite Malthus. Uh, Malthus himself was obsessed with China, and it's the longest single section in his essay. And a lot of the people in the Enlightenment, especially Voltaire, but many others, they're like, oh, China's great, monarchy is great, China has figured these things out, the French should copy China. Malthus somewhat inaccurately describes China as just another Malthusian mess. And he says, well, China may be a slightly higher living standards than much of Europe, but it's because they practice so much infanticide and China has opted for extreme vice. He was wrong about how much infanticide the Chinese practice, but he understood it was an issue for his theory. He needed to take account of it. And he made some very definite claims about China that were not by any means completely correct. So the whole China Malthus connection is a huge topic of its own, but it is a, a truly significant uh, matter to this day. Thank you so much. I think do, a, do a salon about China and Malthus. Sorry, who? who, who? It, was, it was me, Anna, hi. <laughs> Um, I just, uh, what I wanted to jump in here is it's a very interesting observation um, with respect to what uh, Godwin and, and others said at the time. And one way to evaluate the predictive power of any theory, regardless of whether it's economic or socio-historical is, if you were transported into some other time, and we sort of brought this up earlier as well about Malthus being in the present day, if you brought, so if you were transported to some other time in human history and you were a, like your claims and predictions could not be falsified at that time either. It's 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 a really big open question about what predictive power, if any, your theory actually has, if it remains constant no matter where you stand along that curve, right? And and this this is kind of and, and this is kind of similar to the problem with um, the so-called probabilistic doomsday argument about. Um, uh, basically, there's a prob there's a Bayesian probabilistic argument that you can make that essentially computes the total number of humans that will be born ever under the assumption that um, that basically you are equally likely to be born at uh, any given time weighted by population. The thing is, is in, in the doomsday argument, uh, as with some of Malthus's theories, in my opinion, is you can make that exact same argument at every point in human history and arrive at a different number. And so if, if you can do that, does this really have sufficient predictive weight and sufficient predictive power? Also, also I mean, it's, it's also unclear. And I think this really gets down to a lot of what people are saying is we, we can't tell or within Malthus theory itself, there doesn't seem to be any way to tell whether he was right or wrong in the long run. Um, Sorry, OK, I guess Tyler maybe isn't going to. OK, so I'll just go. Um, yeah, I was just wondering. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I kind of hear things that um, I, I want to sort out the agential view of whatever some some theorist thinks versus the um, the more uh, the view of like top down authoritarianism. So, you know, because it's all presented as in like, well, people just voluntarily had one kid on their own, you know, versus a, a set of elites that actually dictated how reproduction was going to happen. So, and I'm not, I'm not clear where Malthus stands on it. And I'm not clear where economists stand on this. Like it just, especially in the US, so much economy stuff is, is driven by this, like everybody's a free, you know, free will, the assumption of free will um, for individuals. We're going to collect views. I, I keep I keep uh, recalling. We just did a reading of Tom Stoppard's Arcadia with interinsect hosts. Actually, Bronwyn here was playing uh, Hannah Jarvis, and there is this brilliant line um, delivered to the professor that you know if you publish your research and you don't get refuted during your life, uh, then you won. <laughs> if if it's posterity, maybe that's only true about uh, you know when you write um, uh, fabrications about Byron. Uh, but maybe it's also true uh, to some degree about doomsday scenarios. Um, if it not, if if you don't predict an actual date, a specific date uh, during your lifetime when it cannot happen, um, then you know, uh, for as long as you are concerned, um, everything everything is fine. Um, thank you so much, and I'm going to go to Andy. Hi, Andy. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Yeah. No, that, that didn't feel like it was too long. It's highly engaging. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah. So. Um, 
last night I, uh, upon uh, Curtis Jarvin's recommendation, watched the movie Logan's Run from 1974. Um, and I'm not sure who has seen it, but it instantly went on to- Love it, that's brilliant. The costumes as well. Mm. Films and I, I read the critical response at the time to it and it was quite like, oh, this is absurd. This is, what is this? This is like a, you know, they took too much LSD and then just, you know, like made this colorful movie. It, it didn't really, I think it wasn't the time for it to really have the, maybe the impact on the mind that um, it did. And I, there were all sorts of little secrets and gems in it, but it's relevant because, you know, if you're not familiar with the movie, um, basically it's the year 2274, uh, humanity lives in geodesic domes and um, they solved a, well, perhaps there was a Malthusian crisis in the outside world. We're on earth, you know, it's the same earth. It's not, not, not a different planet. Um, and to solve overpopulation, um, they have this like death cult like game they play where they all sort of die at the age of 30. And when you die, it's like this ceremony and they call it renewal. And it's, uh, it's a freaking insane um, depiction. Um, I read the plot, but there's no, there was no predicting, um, you know, the way that they um, uh, put, put it into the, um, put it into the film the way it's depicted is, is really really beautiful and I, I highly recommend um watching it so um it is highly i think relevant to this discussion um because uh similar to um like they they, they made this arbitrary call right they're just like someone you don't know who set up the system you don't you just you're dropped into the world as it is um but they made this arbitrary call to like form this death cult it's a hedonistic sort of death cult um and solve their problem and overpopulation doesn't exist you know they have some sort of like artificial womb type stuff so like no one like like sex is purely eroticism and hedonism it's not for um procreation they at the end of the movie um well i don't know how much i should spoil but they get out okay so to they escape this this guy and his and his his this one beautiful woman this the, the the guy that was sort of like the cop of the city and was sort of preventing people from waking up was the one who woke up and it was, it was beautiful. It's, it, it's early echoes of the matrix. It's honestly gives you a lot of the same vibes, but in way less of a dystopic, like nineties punk way, you know, it's far more um, optimistic at the end. It made me grin, you know, I didn't grin watching the matrix and feel like my heart was warm. It, it was like romantic. So um, I'm never gonna forget uh, the experience I had last night. And it just, I think what I take away and what's bringing it back to, to Malthus and relevant to this discussion was, I think that if what I've learned from it is perhaps if a society imposes a um, arbitrary sort of like, limit to overpopulation such as what they did where everyone just dies at 30 and you know they've changed the world then perhaps the human spirit um will break out at some point that's what i that's what i took away and there's a lot i i am still processing it you know this was 12 hours ago but that's sort of what i took away from this and um uh i'm i'm a member of uh sort of like Gen Z, I'm 24 years old. And uh, I just also want to share that this is really an incredible time for my generation. And there's an energy going around right now that um, hasn't quite really, like it's hard to convey unless you're like in the group chat with your friends, but um, just the optimism of Logan's run combined with all the chaos um, and like fun and memes that we're seeing today um, sort of has given me a lot of hope. And so just wanted to share that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andy. I definitely think that, you know, um, a lot of the Malthusian thinking kind of reaches us through science fiction. And as you were talking about this, I was immediately thinking about 
Rick and Morty, you know, the planet where the women are the bosses and, you know, I'm here if you need to talk. Um, and, you know, the planet that was taken over during the great passive aggression uh, for Rick and Morty funds. This is a this is an inside joke. But also Aldous Huxley was um, was a Malthusian or at least heavily influenced um, when writing uh, Brave New World. Um, it's understandable. They, they have the women have the Malthusian device on them with the contraceptive pills and that's how they guarantee their um, their lifestyle. But you, we have Mad Max or Luc Besson's Le Dernier Combat, which is about a shortage of women <laughs> and, and the, the war that breaks out as a, as a consequence. I think that in, uh, in Besson, we have ruined the environment and that's when it happens. So um, there may be a lot of um, uh, fictitious worlds to turn to when we want to um, uh, you know, uh, play with these ideas. Tyler, do you have any notes on science fiction whatsoever? I know, I know you love full Victorian novels. Uh, I don't know how, what's your take on science fiction in general? I would, I I would think you have a, a note on that uh, being you know, one of the, uh, the great ambassadors of progress studies. Well, science fiction, as noted already, is remarkably Malthusian. Often you're in new environments where you've busted out of some of the old constraints, right? You've settled a planet or something. But Malthusian dilemmas kick in again. Kim Stanley Robinson, the Mars series, uh, science fiction and Malthus. It's a dissertation I think someone hasn't written yet, but there's a great deal uh, there. Just two biographical points I wanted to make about Malthus, not directed at any particular comment. But first, the name Malthus comes originally from Malt House which of course is a place of ice. Malthus presumably knew this. So the notion that Malthus is a theorist of ice, I get a kick out of that. Given that his father hung out with Goodwin and Rousseau, I mean, this 18th century odds are his father was screwing around like crazy, frankly. So there's some big Freudian element in Malthus's own theory. He's seeing what his parents did, I think, and reacting to it. But one other thing of interest, I believe Malthus was the first economist to hold a tenured chair in the teaching of economics. And after he worked as a reverend for much of his life, he had a chair in political economy teaching at the East India College, which trained the bureaucrats of the East India Company to run India, which was a terrible mistake in my view. Uh, but that's another interesting biological, I'm sorry, bi biographical fact about Malthus. He was the first professional economist that I know of. Thank you so much. And we know from um, Anton Howe's uh, new book, uh, how the word improvement captivated that era and everybody was trying to improve on society um, and perhaps their parents' behavior with whatever tools uh, they had. Thank you so much. Neville, do you want to, oh, sorry, Anton, do, were you going to um, jump in? No? Okay, so then we go to Neville and then Dave White. Thank you so much. Thanks. So I'm I'm still on this kind of initial point, and um, maybe it's a bit of a reductionist view, but I'm, I'm basically just taking this, you know, Malthusian crisis as no matter what you do, you'll never be able to produce enough to, to support an unlimited population, which will just keep growing. You have to use virtue or vice or subject yourself to misery not to run out of food. And so given that as perhaps a flawed but sort of base assumption, then I'm wondering where that sort of intersects with, Tyler, your great stagnation, because it almost makes that seem like a sort of rational response, especially in light of your like, Malthus underestimated how good we'd make the vice. And if you look at a graph of population growth over time, it's like right around that, what, what is the great stagnation is like early 70s, like 72, 73. So it's like the, the hockey stick kind of growth in population starts just before that. And if you think like, so our, if productivity growth slowed right around then, and what have we done instead? We've invented the internet. We went from, you know, two or three or five channels to a billion channels, YouTube, Twitch, everything always on. So we've just, instead of just trying to make more stuff over the last 50 years now, we've just been getting really, really good at distracting ourselves 24 hours a day. And, and I just wonder how you look at the great stagnation and how that you know, what's like the, the, is there a causal relationship with this sort of Malthusian view there? I think a lot of the advances of the 20th century were manufacturing. We made more stuff, we built more things. That was great. It, it slowed down quite a bit in the 70s. I think we're at a new cusp where the big advances are in biomedical technology. 
most prominently this year, mRNA vaccines. But there are many other things in the works, like there's a malaria vaccine. It's probably going to be quite effective. So the new technologies on the way, they're going to be great at increasing the number of people. Uh, but they won't per se necessarily help us grow more food. So we're entering a new era in this race where a lot of people who are dying now, they're just not going to die. Sickle cell anemia, CRISPR is probably going to take care of that. Malaria gone. You figure dengue is only a matter of time. Uh, coronavirus, we were making remarkable progress. So that will be very interesting to see. Even if you're pretty optimistic about food production, and indeed I am, we just might get so much better at people production and saving their lives. I don't know, there's some chance we're in another Malthusian era soon. Thank you so much. Uh, Dave, do you want to uh, do you want to jump in? I think it's Seth's turn. Do you mind if I jump in now? Um, to, uh, to sort of riff on Andre's point from earlier and to try to sort of save Malthus for those of us who are more cornucopiads rather than Malthusians and think, you know, actually we can make a lot of stuff and people really aren't in super danger in the long run of being underfed and starving. What about we look at one of Malthus's contemporaries across the, uh, or maybe soon after him and look at, um, uh, oh my God, uh, Democracy in America guy, uh, who points out that like the revolution mm -hmm. happened because in France because desire, the growth in people's desires outran the growth of society of produce. So then moving from the Malthusian trap, which is population and need is going to grow so fast that we can't keep up. Now it's just desire is growing so fast that we can't keep up. And then we get back to what we've been talking about, which is desire management, and how do we keep people's desires from getting so extreme that either you know, they get distracted from improving society or we fall into some sort of horrible decadence? Thank you, so, thank you so much. Yes, I think uh, we've been kind of tiptoeing around the word um, decadence uh, throughout the salon, uh, which is supposed to be a bit decadent, right? We like to say that, oh, an intern tech salon, it should be in the evening, it should be the last thing you do today. You know, it's uh, it's entertainment, right? And, and there's something very liberating um, about not having to reach a conclusion necessarily. Um, I always tell my hosts to keep things complicated um, as, as, their main, as their main job. Uh, thank you so much. Anton, take the mic. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I wanted to speak to this um, from another point of view. This reminds me of the Rat Park. Uh, our discussion around here reminds me a little bit of the Rat Park experiments and the social degradation there um, in this so-called utopia. So in other words, where fundamental needs were met and in that experiment, it almost seemed like vice couldn't outstrip um, some, some, some problem with unlimited resources. Although, you know, lately that experiment has been uh, pretty roundly criticized in its setup, but it, it kind of seems that even in a society where basic living conditions are met for everybody without the chance to develop new vices or with so it, it kind of seems like as needs are met the ability to do things in a in a sort of moral binding way is reduced and if you outstrip the capacity to create new stabilizing vices you end up with with something resembling a social collapse so maybe there's more than one kind of decadent society i guess is where i was going with that thank you so much dave and then peter easton so I, I think I had just two, two things that I, I wanted to, I guess, probe, probe you about. Um, so I, I guess Malthus's principal argument raised, uh, rests on differential rates between production and, and people being making. Um, but um, what, what's, what's somewhat different about our time as compared to his time is, is that the, the ability for us to extract information about those rates is, is much improved. We have much more ability to assess um, 
uh, how fast each of those things are going. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts about um, what that means in terms of, uh, in, a, in a very gross way, social control. And then um, I, I guess the, the other point, I, I, no, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, this gets to the China and Malthus point. So China, even before the reforms, gathered a great deal of information on its citizens. A lot of the Maoists decided they were just headed for way too many people. And they said, we need to put the brakes on this. And they had a one child policy. By no means was it uniformly enforced, not at all, but it did make a difference. I think by one estimate, it led to, was it 300 million fewer Chinese over some period of time? It's, it's a lot of people, right? So uh, during Malthus's time, he talked quite a bit, like what is it we know about population? What is it we don't know? Even Hume earlier, had written about this, Smith writes about this. People not being sure how many people there are or were. It's one of the main things people debate for many decades in British discourse. And now we just don't debate it anymore. We, we mostly know. And uh, they couldn't do a lot of social engineering because they were highly uncertain about basic facts and just how late it is that good data, good census data, good economic data come. It's a really big difference, I think, between the modern world and most of the 19th century world. Uh, we take it a bit for granted, uh, but it does matter. And China now is clearly well past anywhere else in the world or almost anywhere, but like UAE or maybe Singapore. And I would say in a bad way, there's way too much surveillance in China, but they do use that information all the time. It's partly how they've controlled coronavirus. I mean, there are serious trade-offs in there that we ought to come to terms with. Do you think, Tyler, um, that, there, that during our lifetime, we will see a kind of reverse one-child policy anywhere in the world? I mean, you know, in Western Europe, this is a huge problem. We Russia. have aging population. Well, we do already, including in China. So the Chinese have not only, not only dropped one-child policy, but they're trying to encourage births with almost no success, I might add, which is itself interesting for any Malthusian. Singapore has been at this for a long time, especially for their ethnic Chinese. They arranged these dating cruises, seems to have no effect. Oddly, the one country that has made birth subsidies work somewhat well is France. I don't know why it has worked for them, but the French have gotten their TFR back up to two I don't think hmm. that's mainly an immigrant's effect. Uh, a lot of countries are trying pretty hard to get more people to pay Hungary. for pensions, if nothing else. Hungary is a really good uh, example, right? I mean, yes. my country, we have this hor horrible um, kind of jokey way of putting it, which is um, which is uh, got to stop talking and start birthing as like, what's the duty for a woman? And this is kind of entering, um, you know, just the discourse um, as, um, as a thing one, one must do. But yes, I, so I was thinking less of in, you know, forms of encouragement and more the, the level of restriction and, and, and enforcement that the one child policy um, uh, in, entailed. Um, great, uh, Peter, I'm glad that we are hopping to Budapest uh, <laughs> after this little note on the Hungarian policies. Uh, and then we will go to, um, I think Henry again and then Z have their hands up. Yes, so I just wanted to add to Tyler's point about uh, life extension. So it, I think it's very interesting that when we were in a Malthusian trap, it was because like the people got kind of like Malthus was obsessed with sex, but many people was also, were also obsessed with sex and food and so on. And right now it's like and I think it has to do something with the uh, returns on human capital, really. Uh, the thing I was talking about in my, my earlier comments is that human, return on human capital, education, and so on, is high, then uh, it's basically worse to have fewer, fewer children, but, but smarter children. So, and at the same time, you also live longer, and you also spend more on life extension. And so there, there are these interesting complementarities there. 
And it's interesting that if we get to, to another Malusian trap, it, it, it won't be because we make too, uh, too many uh, children. It, 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 it's because we uh, kind of live longer, basically. So I think it's it, it was a very good point, I think, that Tyler made. No, just a, no. Anything else? Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, I, I just wasn't sure. Uh, I'll just add two no. quick things. One yeah, is, no. you know, the new Biden proposal is $3,600 per kid. Uh, that's going to encourage more births. However you feel about that, it's very much a live issue. They're probably going to do it. Just another thing that strikes me on Malthus and science fiction if you're fans of Frank Herbert in Dune, that's a story where water rather than food is the constraint. But you know, water and food tend to go together. But uh, that would be yet another example of how Malthusian our literature has been. It's kind of strange to imagine, I think, in our idealistic Western lifestyles that, you know, oh, how did mommy and daddy or mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy meet? Well, we really loved each other and then we had you. And then, you know, how did I come to be? Well, there was a there was a government, you know, tax plan and we really wanted a garden. So we made another child, good for you. Uh, of course, from a Parfitian, uh, strictly Parfitian um, angle, that would be still amazing and great news, uh, but there's something narratively um, <laughs> dismaying about it nevertheless. Um, thank you so much, Henry, we go back to you. Congratulations. Actually, Henry is, uh, if, if I'm correct, uh, you are breeding animals, right? It's like there are little goats or lambs or some other thing that I don't recognize because I'm just very much in, in downtown, in downtown areas. Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's more my, more my father. I'm, I'm the sort of, <laughs> the sort of product of the son that ran off to the, the city. Um, and I'm just, I'm literally, far, I'm, the only thing I'm farming is his hard work for, for content on Twitter. Um, I, I'm interested to know. In a Tyler, way, in a way Twitter is like a little garden, right? That you decorate the shrubs so that the, the neighborhood can see it. Exactly. Um, uh, I'm interested to know, Tyler, whether if we transported you back to 1810 or whatever, and maybe maybe you're cast in the second season of Bridgerton or something, um, and there's a dinner party, and you you uh, let's say you were born in 1780 or so so um do you think you would be there defending malthus or would you be one of no know, knowing only what was known up until 1810 would you would you be a, a malthusian or a or or would you be sort of praising william godwin um and if it's malthus who you would defend does that mean the sort of sort of ebenezer scrooge stereotype um of the sort of you know well if they're going to die they should die quickly and um you know limit the surplus population does does that mean that those kind of people are sort of underrated um or at least our idea of them because it seems that if you do believe that we're sort of heading towards a sort of demographic crunch and there'll be sort of something catastrophic then um then maybe maybe you know maybe they are underrated or that worldview is underrated it's a good question. If I were put back then, my instinct is to think I would have been an anti-Malthusian. And just if you take my life as I know it, when I was, say, 14, when I had a lot of intuitions and not as much data as I now know, I was very much an optimist about economic growth. So I think that's my natural temperament, whether that's the correct temperament or not. And the earlier me probably would have been uh, Anti Malthusian is my best guess. Uh, one imp important point Malthus on the poor laws. So the early Malthus criticizes the poor laws. He says, if you just pay these people, you're going to get more people, you won't help them. So Malthus is often, often considered this very mean guy. But I think that's a mischaracterization. For one thing, Malthus later on said, well, there's a way we could improve the poor laws that, that wouldn't be so bad. But even Malthus at the time, he didn't say, let the people die. He had a list of five or six other policies to help these people, like giving them government jobs, for instance, or easing labor mobility, or ending depressions by stabilizing aggregate demand. He had a lot of ideas for helping those people. Now, you can debate whether or not those are the right ideas. 
in my view, they're actually pretty plausible. But to think that Malthus and a lot of those other people just wanted these people to die uh, is wrong. I think they were wrong about the poor laws, but they were not fundamentally meanies, is my, the way I would put it. Do you think that Malthus's, um, well, strict views on, on benefits, on, on government benefits, um, are slightly responsible for some of his unpopularity today? Uh, maybe Absolutely. Uh... People misread him. The one thing Malthus really insisted upon is you should not give a married couple higher benefits than a single person. And again, I think he was wrong. Uh, but I don't think he did it because he wanted to see people die. He had a whole list of other remedies that he thought would be more effective. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Z. Thank you so much uh, for the video. Hi, Tyler. A uh, couple questions. So is one way to state Malthus's uh, point that there are limits to growth some of those limits are feedback effects from growth itself, uh, say pollution, population growth, increased tail risks, even certain political problems. And some of those limits are, you know, hard limits, heat death of the universe, some sort of physical limitation. You know, maybe we'll find ways around them somehow, who knows. And Malthus's argument is just that the limits imposed by these kinds of growth related feedback effects are, you know, to use, to use your words, uh, underrated or somehow more real or challenging than we give them credit for, as they are more likely to occur in say, the medium term and have catastrophic impacts. And they oftentimes arise from, from human behavior, which is uh, harder to think clearly about than some of these hard limits, perhaps. If that is right, what are the rules for spotting Malthusian limits as opposed to hard limits? And then the second question is, and what does the existence of these sorts of uh, Malthusian limits say about the efficiency of markets? Does it just confirm that Coase is right? We aren't doing a good enough job assigning property rights to people. I know you're kind of uh, bearish on a carbon tax, so I'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that. Uh, finally, I think the intersection of Malthus, China, and sci-fi is some parts, though not all, of uh, the three-body problem, right? Sure. Uh, there's a lot in what you bring up. <clears throat> if we're going to update Malthus, I think we should update moral restraint. So rather than marrying when you're 28, rather than 22, maybe moral restraint is you buy an electric car, you buy a hybrid, you live a green life, whatever that means. And there's some narrow path where that can solve a particular problem. But Malthus, who obviously knew the Bible, was pretty skeptical, but he still wanted to point out what that path was and the hope we would follow it. And again, you just see that Malthusian argument so, so, so many times today. Malthus to me has a more subtle version of it than the people who just preach it, which I think tends to be counterproductive. And ironically, Malthus was literally a preacher, but he gives the descriptive subtle version to try to instruct people rather than uh, the preachy version. That like, yes, there are these various limits. There is technically speaking a path forward if we all do the right thing, but my goodness, I know the story of Adam and Eve, and I'm not going to quite bet on that one. I'm going to refresh my water. I'll be back in two minutes. I'll hear 80% of what you say in the meantime. But if you don't see me on the screen, don't worry. I'm around. Thank you Keep so on much. Talking, please. I was just I was just thinking how you know um, when one calls for moral restraint or any anything to do with morality, you assume a certain you know consensus over what morality is or what good or bad is, right? And and when you lived in you know societies governed by religion, even if you personally you know um, might were not sure what these are, you had a pretty large book to um, to you know, help me, help you make up your, your, your mind about it. And, you know, when we, when we think about moral restraints today, my first question is like, which morals? <laughs> like, what are we talking about? Are we talking about some kind of Aristotelian virtue, um, just lead a good life and have, you know, perform good actions and everything will be fine? Or do you want to go deeper? Do you want to go more metaphysical? I, and so that, that might be a problem when trying to d design them. Um, Anton, so, yeah. so for me, for me, this dichotomy between morals and vice is obviously in the original essay it was framed in Malthus language as a reverend and the product of its what those words meant at their, 
in the time. But for me, it's more like voluntary versus involuntary decision making among among people and populations. So for me, what Vice refers to here is something like, uh, you know, we so to, to, to like bring it to Malthus this time, it's like, well, you know, humans want to have sex. So we're just going to lean really hard into that. And we're going to have prostitution. We're going to have pornography and all of that, right? Whereas moral restraint is like, well, I'm actually just going to wait longer and, 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 volunta and voluntarily sort of take on this burden. And so vice uh, in the broader sense would be like, okay, well, you know, humans have this drive for, for killing and using maximum amounts of resources and being really inefficient and things of that. So in, in that sense, it's, you know, you relieve that vice by substituting something that's relatively harmless in the Malthusian sense, but still satisfies. Whereas in the sense of, of moral restraint, like Tyler mentioned about, you know, choosing to drive an electric car, choosing to be vegetarian, that's something that one must make a choice about. So that's, that's like the dichotomy to me. Perhaps I've misinterpreted. I mean, in Christianity theology and any theologies, you know, voluntary, uh, like voluntarily chosen um, restrictions are at a completely different level than you're just like forced to be good, uh, which is not driven by your free will and therefore it doesn't count as a decision and you will go to heaven less. Um, Tyler, do you have any, any notes on uh, the, the, the murky definitions of contemporary morality, which might uh, cause some difficulties when we try to, uh, you know, regulate them or improve them? Well, to, <clears throat> to go back to the Bible, the book of Genesis, it's striking to me, there is a section on technology, which considers in a sense the Malthusian dilemma. So the building of the Tower of Babel and machines in a sense that like with this act of building, all things are possible, but that collapses. I, mean, I, I would say it collapses because people are quarrelsome. And one thing Malthus to me is a bit too silent on is just how intrinsically quarrelsome are people that they're intrinsic sinners, I get, but quarrelsome is a little more specific. So you get this question in Tocqueville. So for Tocqueville, at least Americans were intrinsically too conformist and complacent. We're not quarrelsome enough. Uh, Book of Genesis, people are too quarrelsome. Also in Exodus. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the Malthusian view on that is in Malthus, the texts. I mean, he himself loved and sought debate, right? So we can imagine that he, he saw it very close to home. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. I will uh, pass the mic to you. Thank you so much for your patience. And then Alex. I was just gonna add to your point now, which I thought was really interesting, which is the, the changing definition of moral restraint through time. I can certainly imagine Malthus being a preacher in the 1800s, there's a very clear line between what moral restraint and what vice is. And these are opposite behaviors that do not overlap. But to Tyler's point that he did not, he did not foresee how technological development could sort of water down vice to a sense of less harmful ways to feed a sex drive without necessarily adding to the population level. And we get to a point today where something like birth control is clearly a technological um, addition to our species that allows for a tremendous amount of sex without a lot of population, but combined with the desire of wealthier, more prosperous, more educated people to choose to have fewer children, which is clearly a type of moral restraint, but they're very often using the tool of birth control. And so in that sense, moral restraint and vice um, sort of merge or overlap or have a gray area where they're both um, solving the Methusian problem. I just thought that was interesting how the definitions change over 200 years. One question I have for the group, which you know anyone could feel free to address, is I just wonder reading Malthus, to what extent do men and women today read this book differently? Uh, it's just an open-ended question. I don't have any data on it. Obviously I'm a man. Uh, but if anyone had any insight on that, I'd be curious to hear it. I wonder fortunately, I I... fortunately here we're safe from cancelable rhetoric. Yeah, no, I... one thing that's striking. I just you, uh... the YouTube comments. I will just. I, I guarantee there will be no YouTube comments. Okay. 
when you look at some of the criticisms of Malthus at the time, one of the big criticisms is he wants to take away the womanliness of women, that what it means to be a woman is to be able to be fertile and reproduce and have your five kids, maybe one of them will die, but that's what women want, that's what women should want. And here's this tyrant who's come along and he's kind of castrating the women, so to speak. Now, I just don't think you would hear that criticism very much today, but that was very common in the early 19th century. I mean, it makes sense if you if you don't have contraception and the only method to um, you know, regulate um, birth numbers is through abstinence, then you can argue that, you know, women will just remain unmarried and they will not have, you know, um, physical relationships with people. And that can seem like uh, like that. But I'm also thinking my first thought when you when you asked, I was thinking about the prohibition and how the whole prohibition today seems almost impossible to have passed, but it was the women who wanted it. And there are some, I think uh, there are a lot of, um, you know, restraints um, that when they apply to uh, to private life, they can really only be passed on, on by women. <laughs> you don't have to go to Lizzie Strata to think that, you know, uh, a guy can write whatever he wants in his book about economics if the, if the women don't decide collectively that no, we actually want birth control, thank you. Um, it's going to just be an idea. Um, so, so in that sense, I think if anything, women uh, took a more um, practical take on on this uh, this question um, and brought it from the theoretical or the the, the area of numbers uh, to to reality. Um, anybody else? Dave, does this relate to uh, this? Dave uh, McDougall, it relates yeah, to this. I th I think it's a semi direct response. Um, so I'll I'll try it. Um, I, one thing we've skirted around and, and I don't feel like I've fully wrapped my head around Malthus as sort of a, a moral thinker. Like, obviously he's religious outside of his economics work. The, the, you know, I've just read the excerpt that you proposed today, Tyler, and I, I've been sort of grappling with, like, to what degree he's judgmental of vice as a solution to these problems and what the kind of moral uh, aspect of it is. And uh, just if I could maybe add another kind of sub question here, I was wondering if, like I was trying to imagine a universe where there could be a Catholic Malthus instead of a, an Anglican one. And I sort of couldn't wrap my head around it. Um, and I was, yeah, I just wanted to explain Explore like the degree to which he engages with the moral questions, as opposed to what I consider to be the quite uh, practical elements that were foregrounded in the, the little excerpts that I've been able to read. Thank you so much. This is these are the last questions actually. So I'm going to go to Alex to make sure that he has had his time. Uh, thank you so much for, for your patience. And then we will slowly start wrapping it up. So I <laughs> just think, is there anything else uh, on your chest that uh, must be shared? Uh, we will make time for you. Thanks, so, Alex. Uh, mine's a little more, almost like a comment than a question. Uh, so it's coming up of um, two things that people have said. So one of them was, um, Malthus was right for 95% of history. And then suddenly he stopped being right because the underlying dynamics changed. Um, and then we've, we've been talking a lot about like the, the moral virtues and kind of the moral actions that you should take, but all of those, just like Malthus is reading are mostly based on retrospective looks at what happened in history. And we know these kinds of paths are wrong. Therefore we should be taking these, or at least one, in, one interpretation of it. We should be taking this course of action instead, because it's the more moral one that helps us in. Uh, for example, for population dynamics, or in the case of like, not having too many children. Um, and one of the examples Tyler brought up was um, moral actions now might be more in terms of um, getting an electric car or having less of a CO2 emissions. But those are only, we only know about those after the fact, after they've happened. Um, I'm wondering how can we, to what sense can we try to escape this Malthusian trap if new issues come up and we don't know about kind of the directions that we should be, the moral path we should be taking until after we've taken the wrong ones and seen that of course, seen where that's led.
Thank you so much for the comment. Anton, any, uh, any notes on this? Um, no, I mean, this has all been fascinating and there's so, there's so much more depth and dimensionality to this um, than one might see at an initial reading. So it's, it's been really a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, 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 I still do believe that uh, until we figured out, uh, you know, going, getting by without eating and, and the kind of birthing robots on Enrique and Morty, uh, these questions will remain highly relevant. My, uh, my closing question to you, Tyler, and again, you know, if you have very brief um, notes on it, um, uh, the audience uh, is, of course, very welcome to, um, to chime in, would be, you know, we keep talking about the, the, uh, our increasing understanding of, of all these constraints and how, you know, we can reinterpret uh, Malthus and, and understand that he was right with a twist. Are there, do you have any intuitions around constraints that we might not be aware of at all? Is there something looming in the future, like the great filter in Bostrom's writing, something that is almost another plane or in another dimension of thinking that we don't expect uh, that, you know, Roland Emmerich never made a movie about, um, that maybe some people are starting to think about and on the fringes of academia or, or the Twitter sphere. Um, and if so, is there any strain of that, uh, that thinking that you deem to be worthy of looking into? Well, I think the, the major risks by and large are not surprises. So the great empires that have fallen, it's oversimplifying to say it's warfare and environment, but for the most part, I think it's warfare and environment. So environment is Malthusian, warfare, is maybe about the intrinsic quarrelsomeness of human beings and how that interacts with technology. That is not mostly a Malthusian theme. I suppose my personal view is say to see nuclear war as a bigger risk than climate change, though they're both quite significant. Uh, I don't think true black swan risks are, are where it's at right now. The known risks are bad enough and it's not obvious to me how good a job uh, we are doing with them. And I see by the response to the pandemic, people's ability to exercise moral restraint to address the pandemic has in most countries not been so great, especially in the West. And I think we should take that very seriously as a negative with respect to Malthusian problems. One other point I would make about Malthus that we hadn't brought up is reading Malthus was the inspiration for both Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace to develop their theories of evolution. They both said that by reading Malthus, the notion of numbers ebbing or flowing and changing with circumstances was the key breakthrough that led them to think through natural selection. So one lesson in Malthus, which was not seen by Malthus, but clearly seen by Darwin and Wallace is just that in a Malthusian world, like what people are is going to change over time. So as a possible risk, uh, if you're going to add a third one, it's that human beings will evolve over time. I genuinely have no idea how, how they will evolve, but it is possible they will not change for the better. And then you come back to Darwin and Wallace being integrated with Malthus. The Chinese themselves, Singaporeans, greatly having this concern. Sometimes it is called dysgenics. And that's a kind of post-Malthusian theme. But once you're thinking in Malthusian terms, I think you can be led to see its importance very readily. Thank you so much. I think this is a beautiful place to end with a little nod to uh, Newton or Leibniz, depending on who you ask. Uh, thank you so much, Tyler. Any, uh, any uh, closing remarks uh, from Anton or Tyler uh, before we uh, just thank the audience for the amazing questions and the hilarious chat that was happening in parallel to this discussion. I will send it to you, Tyler. I will send you the, the same chat. Uh, just fantastic sense of humor, I think, coming from all over the world. Uh, brilliant. Uh, hard to keep a straight face sometimes when you're talking about some big moral question and then you see the, <laughs> the chat during an intern sex salon. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Anton, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, 
I just want to basically say thank you to Tyler and everyone else that this, you know, we definitely had this discussion very much in the spirit of, of what we do in inter-intellect salons. And so it's been illuminating and challenging and, and a lot to say and a lot to think about. And I hope uh, everybody comes away from it a, a little bit richer, um, whether or not agricultural production outpaces that richness. Thank you so First, much. I would, thank, I would thank you all. But I would just say in closing, whatever else you take away from Malthus, to take him as an intellectual model. He was clear. He changed his mind a lot. He was quite open about explaining why he changed his mind. He engaged with his critics. Uh, that's a big part of who Malthus was. He had a reputation for being a very nice man, an agreeable person. He seemed to do his best to raise his family and have good friends. So. Uh, if you're looking for a role model, Malthus is not the worst place to start. He has one of the most adoring um, uh, epitaphs I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it briefly made me wonder whether he had written it, <laughs> but I, I hear it was his family. Um, thank you so much. And Tyler, as that always- That would be a trick. That would be a trick, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it in your will. Like this should be on my grave. I was amazing. Um, everybody loved me. Um, I, 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 I love, you know, discovering uh, fellow inter-intellects long dead um, and understanding that what we do here is not in any way new. Um, we are just reviving a, a good old tradition of coming together, um, bringing our very different opinions. Sometimes our different politics are different academic disciplines or professional fields and, and just having a lot of fun talking about interesting things. Tyler, as always, thank you so much for your long-standing support of Interinterlect. Uh, we love you back. And I will, um, with some minor adjustments, this uh, video will soon be shared with you. So you can go back and uh, take it in again. Um, thank you so much. And great to have had so many uh, old friends here, but also to have met a lot of new faces. Great to, great to have been hanging out with you. Take care, guys. Good night. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you, Anton.
So this is an exciting occasion for me, and this is a conversation that has been going on between the two of them for years, as I understand it, so I'm kind of jumping in the middle of this. And in terms of format, I'm going to invite everyone to kind of jump into if there are questions or comments, anything that you feel like can't wait till the end, feel free to jump in. This is a salon as you have imagined them. So it's supposed to be a conversation. Um, and I'll say, if you don't feel comfortable just jumping in, I think it's fine to just jump in. But me, I generally don't feel comfortable. I think it's fine to raise your hand too. You <laughs> yes, we will call on you. <laughs> Um, I think most of you know um, our, who, who is here today, but Agnes is in the philosophy department at the University of Chicago, writes for many publications, um, has a wonderful book, Aspiration, The Agency of Becoming, that came out from Oxford University Press, and she has a new book coming in January called Open Socrates, The Case for a Philosophical Life. <laughs> cool. So we can wait for that. And Liz is a staff writer at The Atlantic, um, was an opinion writer at the New York Times and Washington Post, right? And has a amazing book that's just came out last year on human slaughter that collects many of the pieces that she wrote for The Atlantic on death row. Um, and we will be, I hope, going into that. Um, but one of the things I've observed is just that this theme of forgiveness is something that goes back pretty deep in your work. Um, so I'm really interested in hearing kind of how you came to that reporting and, you know, a kind of chicken or the egg question, was it forgiveness and these questions about forgiveness, I think you call it the quagmires, mm -hmm. um, the moral problems that it presents us with um, that led you into some reporting and then what happens under the pressure of those circumstances. So the book is um, a lot of the, I think all the pieces are um, uh, reporting on inmates in Alabama, mm -hmm. um, and Liz actually attended a number of the executions, some of which were successful, some of them weren't, and I think they were all cases of um, murders on death row, and so these were people where there were more questions about guilt, um, the, the person on death row was, was guilty. So there's real questions, real tough questions about um, forgiveness in such circumstances. And I think what I found so moving about both of your work is that there are what I found um, strong arguments for forgiveness, more explicit probably in Liz's work, um, but kind of somewhat between the lines and implied in a lot of what Agnes is doing. Um, I think you both have a commitment to the idea that change is possible, <laughs> that change isn't even possible, it's actually necessary. Um, if we're going to live together and have uh, any kind of um, plural life, any kind of um, democratic um, political organization. Um, and so I, I want to go, there's a lot to go into, but I want to start with this because I think we're in a moment that is unforgiving and it may be that all moments are unforgiving and all cultures <laughs> are unforgiving and I'm not a historian so I can't make that argument, but I think a lot of us have felt this acutely, and I, you know, of course there are all kinds of circumstances where, uh, you know, of course we're leaving trails of everything we've ever done behind us, um, where it contributes to a sense that uh, human error becomes more and more intolerable. Um, so a lot of what I, have, where I have approached this is from more the question of human error and the place of human error in any kind of culture. Um, I have been excited to, to think through forgiveness because that is the important uh, uh, kind of complement to human error. If you have human error, you do sort of need forgiveness. So, but I just want to start by reading this. Um, this is from Liz. It's from a piece I dug up in the Washington Post <laughs> years ago. You said, um, if forgiveness had a face, it would be hideous to us now to the degree that beauty is a matter of socially constructed taste. We wouldn't be able to look at forgiveness without revulsion. The face of forgiveness is bruised because it bears its own injuries with grace. So doing permits the cycle of retribution to go no further. It is a hard thing, but necessary. So maybe just kind of take us in to your own journey and Agnes to how do you, you know, what got you interested in this topic and how did it ultimately lead you to death row? Yes, so I've, I've been interested in it a long time because it's such a central feature of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I 
Catholic, um, <clears throat> the, the most um, stunning thing about Jesus Christ is his insistence on the forgiveness and mercy of God. Because it's such a strange thing for a God to do. Um, they're not really about that, generally. Um, they're about justice and retribution. Um, and so it's a very strange thing for a God to manifest himself as a human on earth and choose to be executed for sacrificial reasons in order to um, you know, accomplish atonement and forgive slash have mercy on humanity. I think it's really more forgiveness and then the mercy is, the, is a separate but related thing. Um, and so uh, I've been interested in the forgiveness of the worst sins that there are, um, because that's sort of, if you can forgive murder, you can forgive anything, um, because murder is sort of the direction in which all violence is pointing. Um, so uh, I became interested in death row, um, and I was sort of surprised by what I found um, dealing with uh, condemned criminals. Um, in that, you know, one of one of my friends on death row, before he was executed, he'd been on death row 35 years. Um, and there's just no way someone doesn't change during that time period. So the person who's being executed doesn't bear a lot of moral resemblance to the person who did the crime at the end of the day. I think the average prisoner in the United States who's on death row has been, longer, been there longer than 18 years. Um, so death row these days in every state looks like a nursing home because mm -hmm. um, there aren't really new death sentences being handed out and the death sentences that have been handed out have not been carried out um, in a lot of states. And so the people just stay on death row and age um, under this death sentence, which could be carried out at any time. Um, they sort of don't know. Um, and uh, I, I found that a lot of guys on death row are just guys. Days. I mean, they've gotten older, they've passed. Earl Kane, for a long time, was the warden of Angola Prison in Louisiana, and now he's the commissioner of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. But he says there's such a thing as criminal menopause, which is just the point in someone's life where they no longer want to do crime very much. Um, and that exists. It's a real documented phenomenon, the data, um, which is, you know, people who are crying are males between 15 and 35. Everyone else doesn't really cry. It's those guys. Um, and so after 35, we start to see this precipitous drop off. Um, and there are a lot of reasons attributed to this testosterone and so forth. Um, but you know, given the fact that we know people aren't really going to crime after 35, what are we doing with these 68 year olds on death row? Um, there was someone executed in Texas year before last, Carl Bunchen was executed at 72. They had to bring him in in a wheelchair to execute him. Um, and you know, there's a major difference between the person who committed the crime and the person who's being executed. So that got me very interested in forgiveness um, and mercy. Yeah. Um, I became interested in this topic when I first started teaching at the University of Chicago in 2009, and I was teaching the Iliad. And I had this idea that um, Achilles was unreasonable in how angry he was that his girlfriend was taken away because it wasn't that she like loved her so much. It was just like she was a prize and that, you know, her having his prize taken away where Agamemnon's prize wasn't taken away was just such an affront to his honor that he was gonna, he was just gonna burn the whole Greek army down because of that. It seemed unreasonable. And as I was teaching it, I was like, wait, I, I, I was like, wait a minute, actually he has a really good reason. Um, I, I was just struck by how good a reason he had to be angry and how good a reason he had to persist in his anger. That is, once he was angry, it seemed like he should stay angry because the thing that was done to him, like, because all Achilles cares about is his honor, actually. He doesn't care about anything else. Like, that's who he is, is how he is viewed by other people. And to be disrespected is like to be nothing to be non-existent. And having been disrespected, having had this bad thing happen to you, and the bad thing isn't gonna go away, then if you think he ever had a reason to be angry, then you think he has a reason to be angry forever. And so I was like really struck by this, by, by a kind of like, I was turned around on it. And I, so I started to, I'm like, but surely there's a problem with this argument. 
And so I spent like 10 years <laughs> kind of working with this argument in a variety of forms of like, when did you stop being angry? When do you have a reason to stop, to like let go of your anger? And, um, and the whole time I worked on it, I never thought about apology and forgiveness, which is like amazing if you think about it, right? Um, but, but, I mean, it's specifically not about apology. And people would raise it to me, and I'd just be like, I don't know, it's weird. When does that ever work? And, um, and then, um, and then I think um, um, I wrote this book, Aspiration, and the book made me realize there's something missing from the book. I say it at the end of the book, what's missing from the book, because I realized it as I got to the end. Um, and it is uh, an understanding of the. Uh, so the book is about acquiring new values. And I sort of, even though I say I'm not doing this, I kind of treat it as though people acquire new values like on their own resources, by themselves. I don't really go into how it is that other people help you come to value new things. And I just didn't know how to think about that. And I, 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 I realized that was what was missing from the book, was to think about like the social, how does the social dimension change, like growth, um, self-understanding, et cetera. Um, how does it change it in any other way than like other people forcing us to get poor or something? Um, and I, 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 I then began to gravitate towards topics that allow me to think about that. And apology is one of them. So it was like picking up this loose end that I had always, people had always asked me in Q and A's about anger. And I, I started to think about like what, you know, but I, I felt that was very much like in some kind of weird forest where I don't, like, I don't feel intuitively understand apology very well. So like the, that essay that I wrote, like it went through a million drafts, and it helped me with it. Um, I just kept revising it and rethinking it, and even there, in the end, I'm, I'm still sort of just puzzled by the phenomenon. Um, um, but I think that I'm I'm interested in it because I feel like I have this blind spot um, uh, about um, like forms, but a blind spot. But, but now one that I've become very interested in. I mean, my new book is just about this. Um, sort of forms of like human progress and goodness and change that are essentially interpersonal, um, where somehow you just can't understand it. If you were to think about it from the framework of just one mind, it wouldn't make sense. And then with two minds, somehow it comes to make sense. Um, so that's like the, yeah, that's like the context of it. Yeah. I think you took, uh, in the apology essay, and these are all online. People should go <coughs> Google around and, and find them. I think this was the, the, the apology point. The point. Um, you talk about social miracle, and I don't think you call forgiveness specifically a social miracle, but apology. And I, but I think probably I think forgiveness also would, yeah. would be a social miracle. And yeah. I, I, I think you know the the anger essay. Agnes basically argues we have no rational reason to let go of our anger. And you know the rational response would be could potentially be limitless violence, like that would be rational. It, so it, um, um, there are two like bits to that argument. One of them is when should you stop being angry, and the other is how do you respond to being angry. And um, uh, and they're, they're somewhat separate. You're right about it. You put them together, right? So. So the, 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 the first part is, if you have a reason to be angry, you have a reason to be angry forever. And the second part is, um, vengeance is the rational response to anger. Yeah. Um, and, um, um, and, and then, right, so if you put them together, you get limit, limit, limitless vengeance, yes. But that's where the social miracle would come in, because in a way, Forgiveness doesn't make it any sense. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so, so I, but just to bring yeah. this back, I, I think, you know, as I have thought through the question of forgiveness, I've realized I don't have a lot of clarity on what it, exactly it is. So I'm eager to hear from both of you, mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you define forgiveness? Um, I know that there are differences in how you define it. And my understanding for Agnes is that it has something to do with that refusal of Attributive violence. I, I think that's 
I think that's necessary, but I actually don't think it's sufficient for forgiveness. So I think there's an ambiguity in the way that we use forgiveness where I don't, I think we can't resolve this ambiguity. For, there's an interesting way we can't resolve it. So um, 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 one way to think about forgiveness is the um, intentional divestment of anger. So in some sense, um, choosing or deciding or bringing it about somehow that through your agency that you're not angry. The other would be just the divestment of anger without the choosing and all that. And I think, you know, the reason why we want to include the second kind, you could sort of say, I found I had forgiven them. You know, like, like I never tried to, I never decided to, just like years later, I look back, I, I guess I forgave them. I think that's a way we can use the word forgive. But um, I think that if we, ex if we're like, oh, we'll just be, we'll just be open, but we'll just say it's, um, it's just the divestment of anger, like you could just forget. <laughs> um, and I do think that's different. Um, like you could get hit over the head and get amnesia about something that was wrong that was done to you, and I don't think it makes sense to say you forget you. Um, and so there's some role for the intentional there, but it's like we, we don't really want to make it a necessary condition. I just, so, there's, so I think we're pulled between those two. So basically, it's the divestment of anger. There's some space for intentionality, but we don't want to make intentionality a necessary condition. I really like the thing you quoted from Liz about the ugly face. I think. I think it has an ugly face. I think it depends on which time period you're looking at the face. Like, yeah. oh, for sure. I, I think there's this way in which, like, once you've forgiven, forgiveness looks beautiful. It's like before you forgive, it looks. Oh, I hate it. Absolutely. Um, I think this is in. Um, Agnes wrote a great essay on anger that was the subject of a Boston Review forum, and I wrote. Um, I was completely convinced by your argument that if you have a reason to be angry, you have a reason to be angry forever because the thing can't be undone, even if you're made reparations to or whatever. You still have incurred this injury that can't be um, you know, fixed. Um, and so I was like, well, what do you do? What do you do with anger that is uh, permanent? Because anger that's permanent is destructive. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about what I had learned in um, divinity school. And I was like, well, with God, the way that you stop the cycle of retribution is with a sacrifice. Um, and so I, I started thinking to myself, what are, what are the sacrifices we make that actually discharge feelings of anger and resentment? Um, and I would, I would pair resentment with anger because it's slightly different. Um, but I think for forgiveness, you have to discharge um, both anger and resentment. Um, but I, it came to seem apparent to me that forgiveness itself is a sacrifice because there's sort of like an attort there's like a piece of property that's created um, when someone injures you, and it's your damage, right? People will say, what's your damage? What's wrong with you? What happened to you? Um, and um, you, you have rights that are created when you have damage. Um, you have that right to anger. You have that right to vengeance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You have at least options that are open to you that aren't open to you when you haven't been injured. Um, things become available and permissible to you that are not available and permissible to people who haven't been injured. And they regard your um, uh, strength, power, rights to injure whoever wronged you. And so my thinking was, you know, how do you convince people who have those rights not to use it when it, they feel so good to use, right? Getting revenge feels awesome. <laughs> um, uh, so, so how do you convince people to um, do away with those feelings of anger and resentment, and also to release that property that gives you all these rights. Um, and it's hard to get people to do it. And I think that's why, you know, Jesus in the New Testament goes around being like, forgive people, forgive as you're forgiven. I'll forgive all these sinners right in front of you so you can see what God's about. Um, it, people wouldn't need to be convinced to forgive if it came naturally. Yeah. Right? Um, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask a question about the intentionality and, and forgiveness. So we agree that forgiveness needs to be intentional. Does it need to be sincere? In other mm -hmm. words, do you need to believe forgive? If you think it's the right thing to do, but it's a kind of mercy to forgive someone without actually doing the act of forgiving, is that still forgiveness or is that a kind of act of mercy? Yeah, so I think um, acts of mercy are sufficient. Um, but not, or necessary, but not sufficient for forgiveness. I think mercy is what's implied 
by forgiveness, but certainly they can be decoupled. So you can have mercy on someone because you think they weren't actually in control of their actions, or because they were like a juvenile or someone who you say um, has uh, certain statuses that render the offense actually less offensive than it seemed to be. And in that case, you can have mercy on them just to do away with the, the anger and the, the rights that you have, but it's not based on forgiveness. And I think this is how sort of clemency is regarded um, in Rome. I'm thinking of De Clementia. Um, uh, it's really more about having clemency out of the grandioseness of the person who is offended. Um, forgiveness is actually about kind of incurring injury in order to uh, rescue the person who wronged you. And so this is my position on forgiveness. That it's, you know, people talk about the therapeutic effects of forgiveness, it's something I do to move on, but in fact, as a matter of fact, it's something you do for other people. Um, and so uh, that's sort of where I come down on forgiveness and mercy. Yeah. Does that change in the circumstances? It's one thing to um, have mercy or, or experience that kind of forgiveness to a stranger who's wronged you, but to a family member, it's a, it's a different thing. Um, with forgiveness and mercy. Father and son. Yeah. Um, well, I certainly think forgiveness is easier when you have a strong emotional connection. So hard. To a person. Yeah. <laughs> so hard. Um, but I think people are pretty, you know, if you have a positive relationship up to that point, um, it's easier to forgive. If you have a really negative relationship up to that point, um, then uh, it's, it's a lot harder to forgive. Um, uh, but those familial relationships, I think, just complicate forgiveness. They don't really change the essence. And I think part of why what's so powerful about your account of it is you offer us, you know, a political version. You know, what does it mean for the state to forgive? There is a just moral dimension, a kind of broader cultural question, and then specifically religious question, um, dimensions to it. But to stay with the, the moral part, I think this is what she was, Liz was talking about. She, um, she has called it moral exceptionalism as this kind of status that we acquire when we're wronged. And I find that so interesting and compelling because it's really the reverse of what we're often kind of told. I think this is the narrative in our culture, at least at the moment, where you know someone does something wrong to you, you are the victim. Um, they are the one with the, the power as the wrongdoer. And what you actually say is actually the, the person who has been wronged has a power at least morally. It doesn't mean they have political or social power. But morally, they have this, ex they, they acquire a kind of exceptional status. And I think um, Agnes kind of has related um, a, a rela related take on this in terms of what do you call it? The, the, the dark side of morality. <laughs> um, but I, I think of it, I just, reading this, I was just thinking of this, this line from Louise Glick. I, I read it 20 years ago. And she has this line in this poem and she says, you know, all wounded and dominant. And I remember reading it and thinking like, mm, she's right. <laughs> when you're a victim, you can go nuts. You yeah. can be, you know, if you're a victim of something, now everything's on the table, mm -hmm. right? If a nation gets attacked, as we're seeing in some situations right now, they acquire a right to just go absolutely crazy, mm -hmm. right? And um, that's why I think in culture today, everybody's looking for ways in which they're victims. Mm -hmm. um, because if, it's, uh, if you're in a state of moral exceptionalism, you're excused from the moral rules that govern daily life. You're allowed to do a lot of whatever you want. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in um, nipping that in the bud, which is why forgiveness makes everyone mad. And to, to forgive is actually to relinquish power. Yes, you relinquish yeah. some right to relinquish power. Yeah. Yeah. And how would you how would you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that moral exceptions is a, is a good way to put it. Just, and I think Liz would agree with this. It's an illusion. <laughs> that is, um, you're not actually in any different position than you were in before you were wrong. Um, um, but it, you appear to yourself and to other people to be in a different. And um, I think that um, that um, that state is just a very confusing one to be in. Like when you're inside of it, so like one thing is 
it seems like there's only one thing that needs attention, which is the wrong that was done you, right? So you have this singular focus on the wrong that was done you. And then I think that, like, if you ask, what, here's a philosophical question that I, I spent a long, long time thinking about that I think is a lot harder than it appears. What is the difference between anger and sadness? Um, it's like we all feel like, like there's an obvious difference. Like, obviously, there's two very different emotions. But when you actually try to spell it out, it's not that easy. I can tell you, as someone who's worked on this for years. Um, and I think it's that there's stuff in our lives where um, um, we are relying on answers to certain questions to get us through the day. Um, that is, that's like what gives our life meaning is like, you know. Um, um, uh, like, like I'm gonna, like, like I'm a mother, and I'm working on this philosophy idea, and I'm, um, um, I have like projects, and, and I have a self conception that's based on this project. And then sometimes something happens that pulls the rug out from under me, and one of my like answers to the question of like, what should I do, who am I, etc. And it can, that can happen in two different ways. It can happen where like there was just something I really liked, and it got ruined or something, or I just failed at something. Uh, my family, I will tell you, my family went to see the eclipse, but we did not see the eclipse because we did not leave our houses early enough and there was so much traffic. And so we just spent the entire day in the car going to see an almost eclipse and then driving all the way back. And that was sad. And like, it was funny because when we got there, like, uh, you know, I was like, well, kids, this is what failure is like. <laughs> and my 10 year old was like, it wasn't a failure. And like, he was just, and I'm like, it was a failure. Like, this is just a clear case of a failure, right? I'm like, that's sad, right? We had this project, we had this plan, it was pulled out from under us, we were sad. Um, my friends were texting me like, the eclipse is so amazing. <laughs> um, and, but, but there, like, the, the, the eclipse, I think, the value that it had, okay, it was some extent a social value of us wanting to go there, but it was like each one of us had some reason why that would be a fun or a nice thing or a good thing to be able to see the eclipse. Um, but what happens when you get angry, so that's like a sadness case. In an anger case, um, what happens is, um, say, I, I, we, there's some commitment of that kind that you and I have, and, and we, I sort of thought we had it together. And then you show that you don't have that commitment. So the way the rug gets pulled out from under me is that somebody who I thought was giving the same answer as me to a question about how should we live our lives turns out not to be giving that answer. And if you're not giving that answer, then maybe I can't give that answer either, right? And that's part of why I'm like, now there's no rules. Um, and so there's this destabilizing effect. So like some amount of our moral existence is social. And it's the part of our moral existence that's social that concerns anger. And it's because there's this thing that is getting us through the day, which is like the idea that I shouldn't be treated in this way. That is like, I'm relying on that, I can't live without it. And then it's pulled out from under me and I need it to be put back. I need to, I need to somehow be able to still say, oh, that was wrong. And it's, I, I think, I kind of don't have the resources to do that in that moment. To the extent that I think I do, it will be by means of revenge. Um, but basically it's just that I don't, I'm incapacitated. And so, so that's just to speak on the side of the vengeful person in the sense that like, this is a very serious form of um, kind of becoming unmoored in the world, that, that what you're feeling when you get angry. And it is, it's like this social disconnect and the, the motive, the passion, the drive of anger is like to focus on fixing that somehow. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, some of the cases Liz presents us with, which are, for instance, families whose family members have been murdered, deciding after someone has been convicted, sometimes after someone has been sentenced to death, to forgive them. And there's, in a way, there's no reason for that. It's not a rational thing. Um, but in terms of some of the consequences that you document, I think that we also see um, how it is a relinquishing of certain kind of power. So there are cases where, that she talks about in the book, and they're just incredibly powerful, 
where families forgive you know someone who's about to be executed and actually intervene and save that person's life and the state decides you know they're not going to go forward with the execution and so forgiveness kind of is in those cases is actually a relinquishing of power mm -hmm. over someone's life <laughs> yes. um, and in a way you know, I think there's some of the logic is that why would someone do that? And it doesn't make sense. And this is where I think we turn to language of social miracles or. I have some ideas about why people forgive. Um, I want to tell you the story mm -hmm. about someone who um, forgave. I, I'm interested in what you think, Agnes, because I think this is the most perfect example of forgiveness I've ever seen. Um, there's a guy named John Sage, he's in his 70s now. Um, his sister was murdered in 1993. They were extremely close, he and his sister. They were only 18 months apart out of a family of eight. Um, so they have been extremely tight growing up in a way I think these little, um, uh, what do you want to call them? You know, there's a, the family's a society, and there are people, especially in a big family, who bond more than they bond with other people. Um, and I think John and Marilyn were very bonded. Um, and uh, two people murdered Marilyn. Um, it was a woman named Erica Shepard, who was 19, and a man named James Dickerson, who was 19. James had AIDS, so he was never going to get the death penalty. He died in prison. Um, Erica Shepard, John advocated for her to get the death penalty at the time. Um, and then as the years wore on, and, and also I should say, Erica's totally unrepentant. She, um, uh, it's an interesting case, but she considers herself to have been so victimized that her murder was inevitable. Um, and so she's, she's not sorry. Um, she won't take accountability for it. John decided uh, a couple years ago he was going to try to pursue a mediation with her because he felt like he had forgiven her 99%. He told me there are stages of forgiveness. But he wanted this final stage of forgiveness where he had a face-to-face -face encounter with her to reconcile. And so he started the process through the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to have an official mediation face-to-face -face with her. Okay. And so that process takes a while um, to get the mediation set up. And the Texas Department of Criminal Justice screens people who are going into mediations to make sure that their head's in the right place. And so while this was happening, John went to the district attorney of Harris County where the crime had been in Texas, district attorneys have to schedule the executions. Right, so if you don't ask for an execution date as the district attorney, it just never comes. So John went to the uh, district attorney, a woman named Kim Ogg, and he said basically, I don't want Erica to be executed. What do I do about it? Mm -hmm. And she just said, all right, how about this? Uh, if, a, if a death warrant comes in, I'll give you a call before I schedule anything and you can tell me how you feel about it. And if you still feel the same way, I won't ask for a date. Okay, awesome. So John was like, I don't want her executed. That's not how I feel anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, then Erica refused the mediation. She was like, I don't want to meet with you. I don't care. Um, I'm not going to even talk to you unless I can have my lawyers present. Um, so still had this very, um, this intense uh, reluctance, um, and the mediation never happened. But John still doesn't want her executed because his forgiveness can't be withdrawn, really. He has discharged those feelings of anger and resentment, and he can't get them back. Um, so he still doesn't want her dead, even though this woman doesn't care. She knows what John did for her, um, and she doesn't care about it. And I was like, this is beautiful to me. I love it. Right? <laughs> because it's a pure form of forgiveness. It's not transactional in any way. She's not giving him emotional fulfillment back or recognizing his moral heroism. Yeah. He's not doing that at all. Would you, would you say that's a natural human instinct? No, I think it's because John is Catholic. Yeah, I, would, I would say it's somewhat natural. I don't know how much we changed. Uh, in, traditionally, forgiveness is seen as a virtue, right? It's, 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 it's noble. And I just, it seems to me that, that the situation you're describing is one that maybe happens more than we think, that, that 
is it defining the human characteristic? If we, if we see forgiveness in the animal kingdom, we say, oh, look at that, they're, they're, they're human, they're smarter. I don't know, I, it feels to me like maybe you've seen that, you've, you've seen a lot of, of this um, conversion. I've seen it both ways. I've seen a lot of families uh, want to forgive. Um, Johnny and James, the victim's family, campaign against his execution, state of Alabama, executed him anyway. Um, uh, the family of um, the, the Epps family, in the case of James Barber, um, they forgave Jenny Barber. They didn't want to see him executed. Alabama did it anyway. Um, and then there's John Sage. Um, so you, you see a lot of that. I think people want moral heroism. They want heroism in their lives. But it's not an actual heroic act. Is it? I don't think it's the perfect case of forgiveness. I do think it's the case is very admirable, but I mean, partly by his own admission, it is imperfect because there's something more that he needs than it's something more that he wanted. Yeah, that, but but he wanted it with regards to forgiveness, right? And I think that there's something really wise about that understanding that he has, that there's a sense in which he needs her help in order to completely forgive her. And um, it's, I, I still think there, there's, there's, there's some, in a way, it's more heroic to be able to give up vengeance when you haven't had the help of the other person to forgive you. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I might be happy with the thought that it's even more heroic than forgiveness usually is, but it doesn't seem to me to be a perfect case of forgiveness. Because there's no reciprocity. I think it's a quick question too, is, is it a social process that involves more than one person? Can you forgive on your own? You know, can you just say, I, I forgive you, and that's what forgiveness is? I think you have another example of someone who is on death row is forgiven by a family member and ends up saying, I love this woman more than anyone in the world. That was Jimmy Barber, yeah. yeah. Um, he's that's kind of the opposite case. Of he got really high on crack and drank a case of beer and murdered uh, like a 78-year-old woman with a hammer. Um, and uh, the granddaughter of this woman, Dottie Epps, started writing letters to him in prison. And you know, her explanation of forgiveness was that it's therapeutic. She was like tired of being angry, basically. Um, and Jimmy Barber was like, thank you for this thing you've done for me. Like he fully recognized that whatever her intentions were, it was for him. Um, and they developed a really close bond, which can happen with forgiveness, which I think is another reason people don't like it very much, is it kind of enforces a bond between you and someone who wronged you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Talk yeah. about it as a, pl a plan of peace, and I love that. Yeah. That, you know, it's it's a way of moving forward. It, it's a plan in the sense that it involves different people. And um, you talk about it also as a useful virtue. You know, if you're going to live with other people, it is a virtue that is actually pra practical. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. because you know, when you have ongoing cycles of vengeance um, between clans, basically, you have what happens in Romeo and Juliet. Finally, someone's like, knock it off, stop it, fucking up, sorry, rest of society. Um, and, and that's the, the rationale behind coming to some kind of truce. Um, and forgiveness and mercy seem sort of uh, necessary in that process. And Liz, here's a question that's thrown over the plate for you. Okay. Does, uh, you know, does the knowledge of the existence of forgiveness affect the propensity of someone to undertake a wrongful act? I was going to talk about this, and I wonder what you think, Agnes. Because I think if you presume forgiveness, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it can't. You mean the forgiveness won't work? Yes. You can't undertake wrongdoing with the presumption of forgiveness, because that's just a second abuse. Right. I don't think pre-forgiveness certainly wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, I, I think in some way it's very hard to even to be forgiven. It, I, I find it hard to imagine that people are like, oh, it's fine for me to wrong this person because they'll forgive me. The, the prospect of going through forgiveness is in some way quite traumatic, especially from the point of view of you haven't done the wrong yet, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like to do something for which you know you will have to be forgiven, even if you know that forgiveness is going to come, I think there's going to be some um, recoil there. But it might be, there might be a question, maybe not about forgiveness, but about punishment or something, right? So like, if you, if you know you're, you can do something 
and you won't be punished. Forget about whether you be forgiven. Because the person can still be angry at you, but they're just incapable of doing it. Um, does the knowledge that you won't be punished um, um, you know, serve as a, the opposite of a deterrent, an incentive? Um, and I guess I find it hard to believe that it wouldn't. Yeah, no, I, I think there's nobody in hell. Um, and I think that's all the more reason not to offend God, right? Because you've already been done such a favor, right? You've been spared from this fate you deserved, which is mercy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, how can you not love someone who's shown you so much mercy, even preemptively, right? Um, I, think, I, I think it does inspire good acts, basically. Uh, the presence of, the mere presence of forgiveness. But like, I, I take the question would be something like, um, you know, should we just not even have a criminal justice system? Because it's like, we just forgive all crimes immediately. Um, would we have more crimes if we did that? Seems like we would. Um, and so that suggests um, the, maybe not the issue of forgiveness, but the, the, the fear of punishment is serving as an incentive um, and so there would be a question then about the distinction between punishment and revenge, right? Is fearing punishment just fearing revenge? Is that what punishment is? Is it just revenge? Or is there anything that we can justifiably put in place um, as a deterrent? I think that your, I believe both of your accounts, certainly Liz's account of forgiveness does not preclude punishment. You can have punishment and forgiveness at the same time. Well, in fact, doesn't sorry, it doesn't have any, I mean, everyone on the death row has been punished. They've been in prison for quite a long time. They're currently being punished. They're currently being yeah. punished. So, yeah. so, would it be different to forgive people um, who, who did not have a past and that endured no punishment? Yeah, again, that makes forgiveness more beautiful to me. <laughs> 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 uh, because uh, it, it totally unrepentant. Um, uh, person who's like presumed your forgiveness and has committed a wrong against you and every other bad thing, um, the fact that you can forgive them is even more morally heroic than if you're getting something out of the deal, which is like a reciprocity. Um, so um, I have uh, someone in my life who's totally unrepentant and did very wrong to me, and I've forgiven that person, and it's like a coin in my pocket. I, I did something morally heroic. I really discharged feelings of anger and resentment. I did that. That was me. It's, uh, it's, it's very, I mean, it's heady to get to forgive. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know this is a problem, but I know this is a very serious idea of unforgiving. And I feel like I've just gone through myself um, a process of kind of unwilling forgiveness of somebody, and it just happens. It's like it wasn't that I gave Sharon Olds plan that she just been in a little conversation for me her mother, talking to me in her for her whole life, and then has no idea who she is from now on here. This is her identity. Like, these were the twice, this is her property. Um, I didn't feel that was my identity, but it was kind of a, a physical process. Like, it just happened. Like, you're hungry. I, I just forget. Okay. Uh, now what? Um, the compared with this intentional, almost like a, a spiritual exercise of deciding to forget. Um, trying to be a better person, trying not to unforgive at any point. Um, and we hear a lot from people who, uh, there's a Chris Rock stand up on how he cheated on his wife, and, and he can't trust her because what if she unforgives, right? Like, you're yeah, just driving somewhere, and he comes up, and I get out of the so And it's so really interested in what you think about the, the, the intentional, to go back to the intentional question, intentional. Spiritual exercise that has to be an ongoing work until it's there versus something that just happens to you. Because it, it is, as we're talking about it, to me it sounds like you can create this physical life process through intention. Is, is that faith? How, how does that work? Yeah. Um, I, I think there are secular and religious reasons to forgive. Um, I think, I don't know, what do you think, Evan? I guess I keep thinking that, I keep thinking about this question about incentives and let's say there's somebody and they wrong you and you forgive them and they wrong you again and you forgive them again and they wrong you 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 again and they wr
telling you again. And you've been giving me that. And at a certain point, at a certain point, <laughs> um, and each other. <clears throat> but um, it, you might, um, and I think there's someone in my life who I, 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 I stand in this relation to. It's not that I'm angry with her, but that I, I have a certain numbness where I, I, I protect myself from, an, from getting hurt again, and I'm not angry, and, but I'm, I'm in some way um, not using what Strassen called the second person standpoint. <laughs> like, I'm almost in my forgiveness of her, I'm not really treating her like a moral agent. Um, I am, it's also, it's like, it's, the, it's like the me show where like I've forgiven her and I will protect myself to not be harmed. Um, but I won't, like if she were to harm me again, I would just forgive her. But there's something, I don't know, agency depriving in a way um, about that. And that's why I really feel the force of that, um, there's a desire for the mediation and for looking the person in the eye. Um, and for in a way not having it be a point in my pocket. Yeah, and not having it be so perfect. I think there's a question too of is forgiveness something we do? Um, one of the books I had shared with Liz and Alice is this book by Matthew Potts that I um, edited for Young Press and came out. And he, it's a fairly theological argument he makes in that book, but by his definition, forgiveness is the refusal of revenge. And it's often involves a state of mourning. So it's not you don't release what happened, what happened does not go away. And ultimately, it's not something you do, it's something that gets worked out by God. So, you are, your agency within the schema is that you are not acting in revenge. But the forgiveness is some, in, in some ways is somehow beyond the person. I mean, that that is roughly his argument. I wonder what you would both uh, let me give an example. This is something that happened to me in the past like two weeks, where somebody did something to me that was very unjust, though it wasn't very harmful. And I'll report one thing, which is that when I first found out about this, I was very angry, and I was immediately, um, Basically, for a variety of reasons, because it was going to, um, and I'm speaking very abstractly because this would be an institutional nightmare if this came out. <laughs> 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 um, but um, um, sort of like a bunch of people were like, make this go away. Like, just, just be forgiving and be nice and like, let's move on. And I was like, I can't. Like, it was like they were asking me to walk on water. Like, I was like, I can't do it. Like, I. You know, like it was there was just it was just coming up against the hard impossibility of just doing that at that moment. And but what I realized I could do was nothing. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think there's anything just I can do right now, but I can just do nothing for a little while. Um, because almost anything I do is gonna be is gonna be infected by the desire for revenge. And so I'm like, I'll just spend a little while, like all I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna try to achieve anything. I'm not gonna try to make the situation work out. I'm just, and I, there have been a bunch of situations where when I'm in a morally difficult situation, my rule for myself is don't try to achieve anything, just tell the truth. Like those are the only things you do. Um, and then like eventually things will settle back into place and you'll start to have like reasonable intuitions again. But for a little while you just don't do anything and you just tell the truth. And I, I, I definitely felt like a refusal of French. But it was not forgiveness. <laughs> I was not feeling forgiving. Um, and then, weirdly, like the person, I think this person was very ashamed about what they did, but was not, they would have, in effect, had to make that shame quite public in order to make it even visible to me. And so, you know, was not admitting to anything. But at some point, I just kind of got that. I got that, like, probably deep down, they're quite ashamed about this. And I really wanted, from the beginning, I'm like, I wanted to talk about this. This person is still unwilling, unwilling to talk to me, unwilling to have any conversation about this. Just like, I think they're ashamed. Um, but I, like, in realizing how ashamed they probably were, everything sort of collapsed. Like, my whole anger sort of collapsed. Um, and my point is, like, I, I didn't make many choices in this process. And I don't think I fully, like, I think if I really wanted to forgive her, and I've written, 
And I've like basically said, like, I think, you know, we should talk. Hopefully, I still hope someday. Um, but um, I think that the, that last bit, it's like, I need this other person's help. Yes. Yeah. And I've done what I can on my own. Um, but a lot of it was just not doing stuff. Yeah. And, but also that bit, that, that impossibility at the beginning was like, there no amount of, 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 I don't know, it felt like no amount of any moralizing to myself or any, any arguments or anything just would have worked on me. Yeah. Despite all of my beliefs about anything like that. It's it almost the failure or the refusal to act, refusal of revenge, is the social miracle that creates the conditions within which uh, certain things become possible. I don't even think it is a social, social miracle, miracle, actually. You know? I, I, I think refusal of revenge is not a social miracle. Mm -hmm. I think refusal of revenge is just, it actually is possible to understand that you're confused. Um, and to be like, I'm in a state where I can't trust my judgments, um, uh, where things appear to me that are not the case, um, where in some sense my own moral sensibility is impaired. Um, I think it's unique to you. And <laughs> 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 I, 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 so it feels to me like I can just be like, I have to just stop. Um, um, and I, and I guess, I mean, I don't know, I guess I feel like I have to use that move pretty often, not only when someone's being unjust to me, but like, I don't know, Twitter is super angry at me. And, you know, everyone's like being mean to me online. And, and I don't think it's a horrible injustice, but I'm just kind of like, stop. <laughs> you know, don't do anything, because you're not seeing things clearly. And I, I guess like, to me, that doesn't feel like a miracle. It just feels like, okay, I have a general understanding of what happens when I'm in this situation. I am now in this situation. Yeah. And so I think the miracle is when people somehow work it out and you can never predict a moment when it will happen. Mm -hmm. Like when they'll see eye to eye. Yeah. So that's kind of the way the you know, rational is not robotic. But what is the emotional state at the end of that? If you're, you're not acting on the, on the anger, Oh, you're angry. You're still angry. You're just not acting on it. You can't make the anger go away. But does it turn to sadness at a certain point, do you think? I, I think it turns to something that's hard to name, where the little left, the little bit that's left over, you know, it's hard to name what that is. It's some, at there, it does feel like it's like a weird blend of anger and sadness. Um, so what are the alternative to forgiveness? Eventual anger, sadness, <laughs> sadness. <laughs> no, it's not the next though. Uh, I'm just mention, I think the point about whether or not an act of souls is extremely important. An act that can be made by a single agent is categorically not like an act like marriage, yeah. which is definitionally, although not historically, historically is the exchange of property on the side of the woman's house to the man. But modern marriage, which is, of course, profoundly influenced by the sacramentology of the Catholic Church, is theoretically two voluntary free agents on force. And so it matters essentially to me, not that there's not many valid concepts of forgiveness, but I think most of the conversation is a subjective concept of forgiveness. A person who forgives a person for her, it's a very sacred, sort of dark issue that you've been studying. Um, they don't have the right to tell the state to release that person from prison, nor should we lose them. So their forgiveness is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus says, if your brother wrongs you over and over and, and asks for and ask for your forgiveness, he says you give it to the 797. He doesn't say if they don't ask, and yes. they're a hardened criminal, and they say, I would murder them again. He does not ever teach that a person is obliged to forgive such a person. I'm not saying whether it's right that Christians may say so, but the context Jesus is teaching is Jewish. He's a rabbi. He absolutely believes in justice. The famous rabbinic image on God's two sides, we have justice, the chesed, and the rabbis always say, go with mercy, and that's Jesus' teaching, is forgive other people genuinely. But I think the issue is, if we can forgive other people, we have a claim that we could write the exact. And I worry profoundly about conversations of forgiveness that I think abusers would be delighted to hear. Yeah, that's what everybody has. Well, so therefore, I wonder, what is the connection between forgiveness and an account of justice? And do you think it's unjust to give an account of forgiveness that's uncoupled from justice? I very much worry it's unjust to publicly discuss forgiveness when there's rape victims who are children who will then hear that it's somehow ideal that they should what, come to terms to look at a person who destroyed them. I 
it is very dangerous, dangerous to say rape because of our disability. Well, I, I mean, as a child in Virginia, we're not even that equal moral. I was raised as a child. child. Okay, so, so, so I just don't think, I think the conversation is about forgiveness all can assume an enormous privilege on the part of people who forgive it. And I think the issue of what is the relationship between forgiveness and justice seems to be in it. I'm just very curious what your thoughts are on whether or not we need to give an account of what is justly owed to a person prior to saying, here's what a forgiveness will look like. Sure, I think we've been talking about that, which is if you're raped as a child, you are entitled to pursue any revenge you want. Then that's the fine you say something you can't. You, you can't, the murder, you, you're, there's a sense that that person, by the time they become an agent, you then say harm by that. Renouncing my claim to justice probably is pretty healing. I completely accept this part of the account. It's not that I think forgiveness is good, because sometimes it's not healing at all. So could I ask you then specifically from a Christian standpoint, if you believe that forgiveness you believe is offered and exemplified in Jesus is separate from the justice of God? So I'm Catholic. I don't think Jesus stopped talking after the New Testament. Right? He speaks to saints. For example, he speaks to saints. Um, and the tradition of forgiveness and God's mercy, mercy that has developed uh, in the Catholic Church, I think, um, it expanded upon Jesus' version of forgiveness and mercy. Um, in terms of justice, I think one thing uh, we overlook um, is that injuries, wrongs, create um, moral imbalances, right? You're in that state of moral exceptionalism, um, you have greater moral power than the person who has done wrong. And the only way to really achieve moral equality, to raise that person back up to moral dignity, uh, is to forgive them, because it's sort of up to you at that point. So I think forgiveness is a very egalitarian thing. Um, the question of what do we do with the fact that people have the right um, to exact uh, revenge um, is to say that forgiveness can never be demanded. I'm not demanding anyone forgive. I don't think that's possible. I'm just saying it's morally heroic to forgive. And if you say, but I want to be morally heroic, but I don't want to forgive, I'm like, that's not how moral heroism works. Um, is it unfair to be victimized? Yes. Is forgiveness fair? No. Um, it's not. It's something you do for the other person, and it kind of involves, as Agnes was saying, putting yourself at the mercy of the person who wronged you because you need that reciprocity for forgiveness to be emotionally satisfying. Um, and I think uh, the reason that forgiveness uh, is so upsetting to people is precisely because it seems to be uh, another avenue of dealing with wrongs as opposed to just vengeance, which uh, I think feels more just. And as Agnes was saying, vengeance hasn't been divorced from justice uh, for a very long time, right? It really is totally justified in what he's doing. Uh, when even a river says, stop, there's too much blood flowing in you. Stop, you have to stop. Um, Achilles is still justified in his vengeance. After that point, he says, you know, shut up. So a great society, does what your, does your view on agreement is depend on the existence of God, or is the existence of God so obvious that you can ask this question is in <laughs> Um, uh, you know, the type of moral um, structure that I'm thinking about is, I think, uh, necessarily Christian. Um, you know, the idea that sin will be addressed in the afterlife um, is something that I think has comforted people for a long time. Um, uh, but again, I, I think uh, that was another really great one. It comforts me now as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get to your question then. I just wanted to say something to this question. But maybe one way to frame the question might be, um, and it's helpful to me because it's actually bringing out maybe some doubts I have about forgiveness. Is suppose someone has wronged you? Is forgiveness the best thing you could do for them? Often, I think the answer is no. The best thing you could do would be to educate them so that they would not be unjust anymore. And. Um, 
I think that, so like a question here is about how we think about sin and wrongdoing. One way to think about sin and wrongdoing is people know perfectly well what the right thing to do is and what the right way to behave is, and they just don't do it. Another thing you might think, and what I'm inclined to think, is actually we don't know. We don't know how to act. Acting most of the time, we don't know how to act. We're kind of winging it. Um, we don't have knowledge. We don't have knowledge of good and evil. We're lost. Um, there are certain sort of safety measures you can take, but like we can all go wrong because we're ignorant. And the best thing you could get anyone would be the knowledge. It would be way better forgiveness if you had that to give them. And if you were, there's this part in the Gorgias where Socrates says, "Here's the very worst thing you could do to anyone." He thinks this is like this is this is worse than torture. This is the the worst form of injustice you could commit against another person. So, let it's gonna have to be the you can only do it against certain people, like a young Mussolini or a young Hitler or something. <laughs> and you basically sort of pave the way for them to commit injustice, and then you make sure they never get punished for it. You kind of disable all the punishment. And you make sure that nobody who ever thinks that what they did was terrible ever even confronts them. And ideally, they get to live on like this forever, in eternity, an eternity of committing injustice. He's like, that's it. That's the worst thing you could ever do to another human being. Um, and I think you could almost understand what you were doing as a series of repeated forgivenesses, right? Yeah. As, and that being the most unjust thing. And so I think like I I guess I guess I'm somewhat inclined to think of forgiveness a little bit as a placeholder, and it's sort of I, I, I gestured this in the apology piece, right? Where there's like like we're sort of saying that there can be peace and we can be okay and we can move on without knowledge. I think like we we can be okay even though we're not. I'm not going to give you knowledge of good or evil, um, but there's a better thing that you could give them, much a much much better thing thing in comparison to which forgiveness just totally pales. And it's a much better thing that God could give me than forgiveness. Way more than God's forgiveness, I would love to have knowledge. Um, if so God... This is like the sin in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> yeah, so maybe... I would rather have knowledge. Yeah, knowledge. I would. I would rather know how to live and know how to live well and then be able to make the right decision so that I was doing the right yeah. thing than being forgiven. I think that part of what Liz's account of forgiveness gives us is, again, you know, these are circumstances where people have been already severely punished. This isn't a case of people just being, like, let loose and, you know... Yeah, whatever you did is fine, we're, we're going to forgive you and move on. So I think it's interesting that you pick those examples, but then what you do is you show us, you, you get very fine-grained in showing us how it actually works. So you take us behind the scenes, where, for instance, you hand over to the state the power to take vengeance to its ultimate conclusion. So there's a logic to that. I think like Agnes has argued, you know, that in a way that makes sense. It makes sense that someone who has killed another person should be should be killed. It's that's the eye for the eye. But then, you know, maybe you can talk about, I mean, some of what you, you show is really powerful that it gets really shady. <laughs> it's you know, people with um, the lethal injections, a lot of the companies don't want to be associated with killing people. Yeah. So there are these like you know, in parking lots, handoffs of chemicals, and this is all happening in the American public's name. And a lot of it is under this veil of, of extreme secrecy. So you sit are sitting in these executions, and family members are there for hours, not being told things that they should be told. Prisoners are being tied up, um, you know, for hours with IVs and. You know, you, you account, give examples of several hours of people being poked and not being able to get the IV in. And what I loved is you talk about there's an erosion of rights that is happening to all of us in the process of that vengeance being um, pursued. So I, I'm saying that partly as a response to your, your question, because I don't think that what either of you gives us is an example of forgiveness that... Um, doesn't wrestle with the real problems. 
Yeah, and I think forgiveness is educational um, because you have to come to terms with the gravity of your wrong um, in the solemnity of the person's forgiveness, or you should. Um, even Erica Shepard, who's not interested in forgiveness, um, understands, presumably, how uh, grave the sin is in proportion to how uh, it complete the forgiveness is, right? So you don't have to really, it's not a big deal to forgive someone for showing up late to dinner, right? You do it in an instant. You're like, I'm not angry, I was kind of angry, I'm not angry anymore, they had a good reason or whatever. Um, but you understand the gravity of the wrongdoing in the, uh, the sheer will uh, and the uh, intensity of the gesture of forgiveness. Um, so I do think there's information contained in being forgiven. And you know, it can be as express as you like, really. You can include um, all the knowledge you want in the you know, communication of forgiveness. So this is something we do with children. I'll be like, I forgive you, but don't freaking drink grape juice on my couch. <laughs> like, don't do it, don't get it out of the fridge, don't pour yourself a glass. Call me if you're interested in drinking any dark juices and coordinate on where this takes place and how. Um, and so there's forgiveness and there's uh, an education there. And I think um, the reason that punishment is still justified in a lot of cases through the legal system is because there is an educational function of punishment, right? So I'm not advocating for a complete dissolution of punishment, right? Forgiveness is, um, here's something that bothers me, right? If a family doesn't forgive and they want vengeance, that will cause prosecutors to seek the death penalty. They'll talk to the family and they'll be like, all right, you got it. We're gonna seek death for this guy. And prosecutors, when they seek death, almost always get it. So if a family wants someone dead, they can have that. If a family does not want someone dead, they can't have that. Yeah. It doesn't matter if families forgive people on death row. The state doesn't care. They've already got their penalty laid out. Um, and so it seems like in, you know, in our society, forgiveness and mercy are extremely disempowered versus vengeance, um, which is a, an imbalance that I think about a lot. And it's why I don't think we're really in danger um, in America of letting uh, abusers off too easily. Um, because we, it seems to be vastly in the other way where people are getting like 25 year prison sentences for a robbery or something. Is there a, a danger to the kind of aspirational quality of, of forgiveness that, you know, do the unforgiving need to be accommodated and forgiven? When I think of a first situation like these who um, were killed by a drug driver in, in their early teens. And, you know, part of me looks at my, my family to say, would it be a kind of Aspirational transcendence with them to reach a point of, of forgiveness. You know, five years later, the woman was sentenced to 15 years. How do you read that? Is that right? Is that wrong? Is that enough? Is that too little? And uh, and is it wrong for me to wish that for them? To the degree of level? And I feel very guilty that I wish for them because I feel like they're entitled to what they feel. Yeah, and they are entitled to what they feel. So that's why I say you can't demand forgiveness of people. I'm not even sure you can prompt it. You can say, please forgive me. Um, but I don't know that that necessarily prompts forgiveness, right? It's still a, a decision somebody hasn't come to, and that's just more information they have in making that decision. I think it's perfectly fine to wish that someone could come to terms with forgiveness for a lot of reasons, for the person who is forgiving, for the person who is being forgiven, um, you know, for a general um, peace in society. Um, and I, I don't think it's wrong to wish it for people who don't want it. It would just be wrong to demand it of people who don't want it. Also talk about how we don't necessarily need forgiveness for other people. We also need it because we need it. <laughs> we're, all, we're all in need of forgiveness, so that's part of why it's a useful relationship in our world. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. It's such a genuine conversation. I so appreciate the, the, the value of your work. I come to this conversation as a Christian and a theologian. And um, one thing I think about around forgiveness is it is implied in what you just said. Uh, so it may be superfluous for these things, but that by saying you forgive someone, you are, that implies that a wrong was done. It defines a wrong that was done. So it's not the same as if, I, you know, someone, if you're someone's lady and you say, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. And that's an excuse, excuse me, that's not forgiveness. But it, in saying I forgive you, if someone's 
theological perspectives actually on forgiveness. And it, like there's one perspective where um, you're an imperfect creature and you know, you've done something and we recognize it as an imperfection, so it's forgiveness, not an excuse. But we, in effect, I think forgiveness says, yes, but this is who we are and we have to accept that, that, that we are these imperfect creatures. And I guess there's like, what I'm realizing through this conversation a little bit is like, there needs to be some of that, but there, in my view, and this from your point of view would be sacrilegious, in my view there's also something like, yeah, but we also need to try to be gods. Um, we need to try to not be imperfect creatures. We need to strive to, like, to actually know why this wrong was wrong, which I think in almost all cases we do not actually know. We feel very strongly, um, we feel very passionately that the wrong was wrong and that it was evil, but do we have a count of exactly why? Um, can we explain it? Can we teach it? Um, I think if we had that, we would just teach it to the wrongdoer and they would know and they would understand and they wouldn't do it. And, and the skepticism that we have about that, like. Um, is just is just skepticism about how powerful knowledge would be if we had it. Um, so I I absolutely agree. I mean I I agree that we need justice. I agree that in these cases these people have already paid penalty for their wrongdoing. I agree that forgiveness makes sense but can't be demanded. So in some sense I like I agree with all the claims at a certain level, but I think there is something higher than forgiveness, which is knowledge. And I also think some forgiveness can have an educational component. I don't think it actually needs to, though. Like, I've certainly forgiven people without really being able to educate them. Um, and certainly in the case where somebody, you know, doesn't even want to know about it. Um, so I, I agree that it can, but I think it's not essential to forgiveness. I think forgiveness, there is really this idea of we can have peace, um, which is n not the same idea as we can have knowledge. Yeah, so I'm um, interested in how this conversation about forgiveness relates to like, the quality of solidity or dignity or reverence that you have in the objects that are being violated. Um, and I can name also the, the object of the person violated. So um, it seems like the beginning, so there's like, it seems like there's an underlying cosmology that's, that seems to have to be in place for it to make sense. If you have a, Cosmology that's just about violence and competition. There isn't a claim that ends up getting generated from this violation. It's just an event. And you can have strategy at that point, but maybe not very goodness. Um, I think there is almost a danger, though, if you push forgiveness too far, that it start, that, that sense of reverence or solidity starts to pass the other direction. So you end up having a moment of violation, and then as that moment of violation um, is handled through forgiveness, it actually like wipes away the feeling that that object that was violated had value in the first place in some kind of magic. And I just actually wanted to ask you, um, kind of related to this, um, when Socrates decides not to escape from prison, <laughs> why does he <laughs> make that choice? Because the revenge is wrong. And it's right. Yeah. So, 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 so even just leaving, yes, it would be revenge. revenge. Yes. And that is revenge, right? Yes. So, so it's um, not wiping out the injustice. Something unjust is being happened. Yes. Happen yes, something unjust is about to, it, I mean, it has already happened in yeah. that the state has made a decision that was unjust. Um, and Crito says, you're letting them get away with it. You're letting your enemies get away with it. And justice means giving your enemies their due. Right? And so 
Um, look, and, and Socrates is like, I want, I want to go through this with you very carefully. And there's this wonderful passage where he says things like, okay, so doing bad things is never good. Do we agree to that? And if we call the bad things by another name, like, um, like revenge or what someone deserves, do they become good then? No. Um, what about if someone did another bad thing to you first? Is, is doing bad things good then? No. Is harming people ever good? No. Um, is treating people unjustly ever good? No. Does it matter whether you call it harming them, treating them unjustly, or um, doing bad things to them? No. None of these things matter. Never do bad things to anyone, ever. And I think that Socrates thinks that there is a kind of poison that we get into, that's the moral exceptionalism, where victims start to think that doing bad things can be good under certain circumstances. And I think like the one thought that, <clears throat> you know, Socrates has like a few core principles, and this one sounds so so much like a truism, but it's actually incredibly hard to stick to. It's just don't ever do bad things. It's a simple rule. Um, and he thinks that escaping from jail would be that. And Crito keeps saying things like, but think of your children. Think of how you could um, you know, how you'd be welcomed over here. Think of how bad I'll look if I let my friend die and it, did, it seemed like maybe I wasn't willing to pay enough money to get him to escape. <laughs> and Socrates is like, stop bringing up those things. Those are irrelevant. The only question that we have before us is, is this a just action or not? If it's an unjust action, I can't do it. Um, and so I very much think that he is thinking of what's being proposed to him as revenge and it being forbidden from him, for him on exactly those terms. So is it an act of forgiveness? No, it, there is really forgiveness in ancient texts that, um, you know, in the Iliad, there are like a whole bunch of scenes of somebody throwing themselves at another person's feet uh, and, and they just get killed. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, until Priam and uh, Achilles, right? So it sets you up, it's amazing scene because you know, you watch this scene happen with like Adrestus and Menelaus, and you know, Suppleus, Suppleus, who grab the person's feet and be like, "Please don't kill me," and they just kill him. Um, and they're and, and 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 I and I think it's I think it's Menelaus, and Agamemnon's like Menelaus is considering wavering. Agamemnon's like, "What are you thinking? Of course you kill him." Um, <clears throat> Suppleus are just killed. Um, and what happens between Achilles and, and Priam is not forgiveness. It's like they somehow, and it's this amazing, like that is really a miracle. They somehow, somehow Achilles, um, you know, reminds Priam of his son Hector, and Priam reminds Achilles of his father, and they just like see the other person as a human being, where until that point they just seen him as the enemy. And um, I don't, I don't think there, there's no talk of anything like. Um, I forgive you for killing Hector, I forgive you for killing Patroclus. And in fact, um, Priam is encouraged to sneak out of there the next morning before Achilles wakes up because he might still just kill him. Um, so, so no, there isn't, I don't think there is really, I mean, I think that Liz is right about Christianity, basically, um, uh, that that's where this idea, you know, really kind of explodes. Maybe there are hints or something or intimations of it. I mean, in the Oresteia, um, you know, which is the story of a cycle of violence, um, um, you know, with like um, Agamemnon kills Epigenion and Clytemnestra with Agamemnon kills, and, right? And they keep killing each other, and eventually, well, we, what do we have not forgive? It's a court, right? Right? We have a justice system for dealing with this situation so that we don't keep killing each other. That is, the solution to us killing each other back and forth is the justice system, not forgiveness. Um, so I think that I think that forgiveness just actually isn't on the table. It actually doesn't exist yet, really, as a social practice. Okay, coming out of you know Hebrew Bible starting with human error, that's where everything begins, and it's kind of the bedrock of the whole vision of humanity and of creation. Is that? But not only human error, God's errors too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And God who makes these mistakes, He makes this creation, and it's. Turns out terrible. So well, 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 like, <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I have found it incredibly powerful to, to, you know, to, to try to view reality through that lens. Of error is the fundamental basis of reality, and this was, you know, I think of the medieval cathedrals that had the errors built into them, or. Some of the indigenous textiles, they would have what they call a spirit line. It was like a little line, that, and it was this idea that 
the weaver had made something and put their soul into it, and they could be trapped. If it was perfect, they would be trapped there. And so the spirit line becomes a way out of the story or the narrative or the, and that's sort of how I think of human error is all, if, if it's there, you have a way out. There's a future. You know, you can have these generations. That's where birth becomes possible. The next generation becomes possible because of the fall. But we have probably time for one more question. I had a quick question for Liz, actually, mostly because I agree with Agnes. Um, <laughs> can you clarify what's so heroic about forgiveness without atonement if one doesn't, and as a Jew I don't, have the Christological context, no. since it seems, okay, and in that regard then. Right, because right. no, you mentioned there were secular religious reasons. Right. So, so in, that, in that regard, the heroic is not only Christian, but just, an ex not exaggerated, but an extreme thing to do but its religious justification is inseparable from. We have to think about what a Christian makes. I think that Christianity is good. So it's the only <laughs> way I can talk about the good. Anything else would be disingenuous. Right? So um, from that perspective, um, because if I talked about the good, say, in a liberal context, like what is the good from the point of view of John Rawls? I would just lie. Um, One can say he's quite Protestant too, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just be making stuff up. Um, my husband is not religious and can't come up with an account of what forgiveness is with. Um, he thinks my uh, egalitarian argument, which I made up from that, right? because, because math is equality, right? And it's all about fairness um, and equality. And I'm like, look, 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 I've got this equality argument. And he's like, nah. <laughs> Why is math forgiven? Um, math is merciful. Matt will always think a wrongdoer did wrong and he'll pity them um, because they don't know what they're doing. And so he has this view that if people knew what was right, they would do what was right. Not like absolutely <laughs> untrue, um, like facially untrue in society. Um, uh, you talk to a lot of guys on that row who are like, yeah, I knew what I was doing was wrong. Bart Johnson, one of my good friends on Alabama's death row, got pulled over for speeding. Um, cop walked out of the car, it's like, I see a license and registration. He pulled a pistol out of his glove box and shot him in the face. Right? Bart knew that was wrong at the time. That's not how you deal with getting a speeding ticket. Um, uh, but he did it anyway. And uh, I'm sure he had his reasons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I asked him one time, can I talk to you about the crime? He goes, what do you want to know? It's pretty clear. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yeah, you've got a point there. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's hard for me to come up with an account that's super convincing of forgiveness um, that isn't explicitly Christian. And I'm just okay with that. Damn. Can I jump in there with one last question, Jennifer? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. this is something I've been kind of rolling over in my head this whole time. So I'm totally, I totally hear you, and I'm 100% there with the social miracle. Peace. I think that's so true in narratives that are in my own life and in like stories I read. It's kind of like gas moment where you're like, this is broken despite all the logic. Um, and it's also interesting to me, Liz, in your work that I think forgiveness, as you said, is unpopular on the right hand on the left. Um, everybody kind of hates it. It's vilified by all sides. And so my question is, and, and in part of that I think is because, like politically. I think there's a sense, maybe on the left especially, that like who are we even forgiving? Like there's systems that have been so entrenched for so many years. Like how can we possibly forgive like hundreds of years of abuse? Um, who do you forgive when that's when that's the framework that you're being, you know, that you're living in then? And so my question is just like how do we recover a sense and, and I guess the answer to that, what I'm just thinking is like you have to adopt a posture for forgiveness and you just have to like that has to be a practice. Like that has to be your posture for the world, but obviously there's lots of like rebuttals to that idea. So I guess where we're going is like, what if you're saying that forgiveness, your account of it is a specifically Christian account, like how do we recover our sense of forgiveness culturally? Because as Jennifer wrote her week of copy, our, our culture is so unforgiving and our world is so unforgiving. And like, what does that look like today? 
how do we recover a culture of forgiveness? I think it's totally doomed. Yeah, I think the prospect of you know encouraging people to be forgiving, uh, which is what I always say, I'm not asking you to forgive, I'm asking you to be forgiving. Right, just take a general posture in your interactions with people um, of forgiveness. I think what one thing that you know, forgiveness, at least in my account, requires um, is for a person to recognize this sort of brotherhood of error we all share. Um, and that's just not something people like. They're like, no, 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 I'm right. You guys are wrong. Um, and it, it misses the deeper sort of moral issue of, um, you know, the fact that we all sin and we all err against one another and against morality. Um, but I think as a social project, it's just doomed. I think that we don't have a culture. There's a lot of liberalism is involved in this, right? Because forgiveness is unfair, right? So liberalism is kind of, over the years, mercy used to be a lot more common, even in justice systems. You would have uh, offers of mercy and examples of mercy. In the medieval era, if you went to a church and claimed sanctuary, um, even if you had a death sentence, the church would negotiate a life without parole as if they exile. Um, and so I think, you know, liberalism has made mercy and forgiveness a lot less common. And I think under you know a, a justice system that prizes equality and individual rights, it's hard to come up with an account of why forgiveness is good. It's, it's a strange, exotic thing, and that's what I was talking about when I said forgiveness is ugly to us. Um, and I think it's ugly to just about everyone of every political persuasion. Can I say something? I want to say something in response to the previous question because I actually do think you can make a case for how forgiveness is heroic, even if you're not. Um, maybe it's going to depend on how flexible you are with the definition of forgiveness. But and the, the, the inclusion or exclusion of atonement is part of it. Right, right. But even without atonement, so so I think that you know the definition that you got from Potts, uh, yeah, um, um, the refusal of vengeance. <laughs> like sometimes there'll be a really overwhelming desire for for vengeance that is. Um, induced in a person by the circumstances that they're in, and it can be heroic for them to refrain from that. I actually think it's pretty heroic for Socrates to not escape from jail. Um, and the, so that's a refusal of vengeance, and w in where there's no atonement. Um, um, now, if you want something more, and you want to package something more in your forgiveness beyond um, for instance, Socrates continues to think that what the Athenians have done to him is unjust and that that's really bad. He thinks it's really bad for their souls because injustice primarily harms the soul of the person doing it, according to him. Um, so he thinks like it's a really bad, it's a really serious wrong. He doesn't change his mind or mitigate that at all. Um, but, so, but it still seems to me that, that, that the refusal of vengeance can be heroic and that you can have that, and it can be heroic even in the absence of atonement. Do you think my um, little bullshit art on egalitarianism works for forgiveness and liberalism? <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> well, do, we have, do, do we have time? Are we okay? Yeah. Like oh, it's a, a, my, phone, my watch is an hour behind. I'm like, we have plenty of time. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Just getting into um, when you do wrong, you incur moral damage, basically. And um, you incur moral damage to yourself yeah. um, by doing wrong against another person. Um, this also creates this state of moral exception for the other person. Uh, the other person should want to discharge their moral exceptionalism because they should want to be morally equal with everybody else. And so they should raise up the person who has been morally diminished by their wrongdoing, by discharging uh, revenge or any other uh, you know, destructive act towards them that would be aimed at diminishing their moral status more or sort of crystallizing and actualizing their diminished moral status. I'm able to take revenge on you because your life no longer counts as much. Wouldn't forgiveness be a way of raising them back up to equal moral dignity and bringing yourself down um, by discharging this state of moral exceptionalism? Think about that. So I think there's something to it, actually. Um, but here's why I, I, think, I think it doesn't quite work as it stands just because you might say, why can't I discharge financial inequality the same way? 
you're extremely poor, I'm extremely rich. That's good. I'm not, I'm not going to give you any money. Yeah, right? But I'm like, but I'm just going to, like, you know, uh, I'm just going to give you as my equal. Like, let's say you're really suffering or whatever, right? Like, it's, um, um, and you might, you might, people who are very worried about financial inequality might say, well, it's not enough to have some kind of attitude. There's something that actually needs to be changed in order for us to become equal. And so you might think there's an analogous thing there. It's almost like you're viewing something as though something were the case, but the thing hasn't happened yet. I actually think you're right that that state of equality, that state where they have been restored to their status, is the goal. So I think the idea that there is a goal and the idea that forgiveness aims at that goal is correct. The question is sort of how do you actually achieve the thing like so that you actually are equal, um, not merely by saying so or like decreeing it, but bringing it about, which it may be that just, it may be in some cases very little is required to bring it about, but it may be that in some cases like, you know, we all need to learn a lot in order to, for that to, to come about. So it's more like I think that there's like some kind, of, I, don't, I don't think it's a crazy argument, um, it's just that there's, that, 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 that um, there's a question, is it always up to the person? Is it always in the power of the victim to bring that about? I'm not sure that always is. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So we should probably wrap it up there. Um, we do have a bar out there, and we would invite <laughs> everyone to come join us and continue the conversation. Um, so thank you so much, Anna. Thank you for